Thank you, everybody. I'd like to call to order the Town of Los Gatos Planning Commission on Wednesday, April 8th. Kane? Present. Commissioner Erickson? Here. Commissioner Hansen? Here. Commissioner Talisfor? Here. Vice Chair Benami? Here. Chair Birch? Here. And Commissioner O'Donnell has excused absence. I'd like you all to please stand and join Vice Chair Bondami in doing the Pledge of Allegiance. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. The town of Los Gatos strongly encourages active participation in the public process, which is a cornerstone of democracy and essential to the Planning Commission conducting its business on behalf of the town council and the citizens of the town. There are several ways for members of the public to participate. Written comments about agenda items are, that are submitted prior to meetings are always helpful. At the meetings, there are two opportunities. First, in the verbal communication period, an individual may speak on any topic which is not on the agenda. And second, any member of the public may speak during the public hearing of an agendized item. We ask if you are going to speak that you please fill out the speaker card, which is in the seat backs in front of you. I would also like to ask, uh, considering the agenda we have in front of us tonight, I do know that we have an item that may uh, solicit discussion on maybe a coinciding application. We would ask if you have interest in speaking on that, that you please do so during the verbal communication portion of the meeting. Do we have any items on the consent calendar this evening? No. And do we have any continued items? We have one requested continuance for item number one. We need a motion for that. Do we have a motion, <coughs> Commissioner King? I approve the requested continuance. Do we have a second? Commissioner I'll second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. So. These are all like something to print. <laughs> so just, uh, we do, I believe, have the March 25th minutes. Yes. Um, so if we can get a motion for that as well. Yes. Commissioner Badami. I'll move to approve the minutes from March 25th. The second. Commissioner Talisfor. I'll second that. All right, great. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. In addition to sitting on the Planning Commission, members also sit on various committees and commissions within the town. Do we have any reports tonight? None? All right. So we'll now move to the verbal communication portion of the meeting. Anyone wishing to speak, like I said, please fill out a card. I have one card right now, John Shepherdson. So we have this um, green bike lanes ribbon cutting event coming up. So uh, I would encourage everybody that's here or anybody who's watching to attend that event. Uh, secondly, um, this is the first, I'll call it a town biker award. Uh, Stephen Conway, our finance guy, bikes to work. So I have somewhere in one of my pockets a uh, $2.00. Um, item it's a uh, choose that I would offer to Mr. Conway if it's not an ethics violation for uh, this award so I'll put that here right now um, next um, the sheriff uh, police department question presented should the town seek a third party review of our police department to potentially save to six million dollars a year 120 million over 20 years Summary argument, yes, the sheriff communities are, are safe or is safer or is safe. That's Saratoga and Cupertino. With the sheriff, we can save millions. Los Gatos budget's 14.2 million. Asking, and I'm asking for a comprehensive review, perhaps by management partners. Uh, two basic factors, safety and financial cost. Uh, Saratoga, according to SafeWise, is the safest city in the state. Los Altos Hills, third. Cupertino, 12th. 
all uh, serviced by the sh uh, sheriff. Los Gatos is not in the top 50. Um, response times overall, the sheriff is superior to the Los Gatos when we're using uh, Los Gatos versus Cupertino. Um, other benefits of the sheriff, helicopter. Um, now we get to the finances. Los Gatos is $9.6 million more than Saratoga. Um, Cupertino versus Cupertino, Los Gatos is $4.3 million more than Cupertino, and it's uh, about double our population. Um, apples to apples. If you break it down in terms of the cost per citizen for our police department, um, we're, Saratoga is about $158 a citizen, Cupertino $175, Los Gatos $417, and that's approximate numbers. Um, so why switch? Why look for cost savings? Because we're looking at opportunity costs. If we put money towards the police department, then it cuts into other services that could be offered. So we have 40 million in unfunded repairs. We need to uh, repair the um, Almond Grove streets. Um, traffic's a problem. This is things that we could do if we had the money, bus program, tax cut, community center, performing arts, um, and dependency on large projects. So um, with that, and you can read that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shepherdson. Do we have any questions for the speaker? Seeing none, thank you. As there's no more speakers in the verbal communication portion, we're now going to move on to the public hearings. We'll move on to item number one, which is actually item number two, but since we moved to item number one, I'll now refer to this as item number one. Uh, this is a portion of our agenda to consider a general plan amendment application, GP-14-002, which is a public hearing to review and provide a recommendation to the town council regarding the 2015 to 2023 housing element. Are there any disclosures from the commissioners on this particular item? Ms. Pervetti, I understand you're going to be giving us the report today. Thank you very much. Um, tonight is a very important evening because the Planning Commission is holding its formal public hearing regarding the housing element. At our last meeting, we conducted a public workshop to provide the Planning Commission with some background, an overview of what the housing element is, and some of the discussion points that occurred during the process. The town went through a very public process in the development of its housing element for the planning period of 2015, 2020. We had a council-appointed housing element advisory board on which uh, we had several planning commissioners serve, including commissioners Hansen, Erickson, and Talisfor. Uh, prior representation um, during 2014 included former Chair Smith, as well as uh, current council member uh, Sayok, then uh, planning commissioner Sayok. So the planning commissioner com commission was represented throughout the entire process. The public was also invited to provide their comments throughout the process. Um, and this evening we will also provide opportunity for the public to provide their public testimony in advance of your um, deliberations. The housing element is really a plan for housing for all income segments of our town. And the goal is to identify adequate locations for housing of different types and to make sure that it uh, meets the town's goals and is consistent with our overall long-term plan called the general plan. Last uh, meeting, you, uh, we discussed some of the different options considered by the Housing Element Advisory Board, and I do want to point out page four in your staff report this evening has the two tables that really were the essence of the Housing Element Advisory Board's discussion. Clearly, where we uh, locate housing is an important concern for our community, and we want to make sure that we give that um, the thought that it deserves. Table three identifies the sites that were identified back in June of 2014. After receiving comments from the state, the Housing Element Advisory Board um, took a fresh look at the sites and reassigned uh, those sites to Table 4, which essentially shifted 
the housing sites from the affordable housing overlay sites to the North 40 specific plan. Many of the other strategies remain the same, such as the use of second units, enhancing our second unit program, and other parameters. I point this out because I think this is one of the places where the Planning Commission may wish to have some discussion and may want to focus um, and one element of its recommendation to the town council. It's also perfectly fine if the planning commission, we do need a, a vote or a majority motion, but it's perfectly fine if there are um, a variety of opinions, your staff will do its best to convey to the council the variety of opinions um, on our planning commission. In addition, uh, the Housing Element Advisory Board came up with additional recommendations for council consideration. Those are outlined on page five of your staff report uh, and continue to the top of page six. I bring those to your attention because the Planning Commission and your review of development applications, you're so close to these topics that you may have additional recommendations that you would like to forward on to the town council. So you're certainly free to uh, pass along the Housing Element Advisory Board's recommendations, but if there are additional ones, we're happy again as your staff to, to move those forward. Uh, with that, I'd like to just say that staff is recommending that the Planning Commission recommend approval of the housing element. The next step of the process, should that be your recommendation, it goes to the town council. The town council is tentatively set to hear this item on May 5th. They will also conduct a public hearing and take additional public testimony. You should have received last uh, yesterday, as well as at your place, an addendum to the report. There was some additional information um, that one of your fellow commissioners put together, um, and so we wanted to make sure the, the full commission had that information available as you go through it. Uh, staff is available to answer any additional questions. We recognize that there's a lot of detail and a lot of information, um, and we're looking forward to your discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prevetti. Do we have any questions? Commissioner Kane? When you say that uh, staff is recommending adoption of the document as we have it, does that, in, does that include the four recommendations from the Housing Element Committee? Yes. Thank you. Do we have any other questions right now? All right, seeing none, I'm going to open this up to our speakers. If you have not already turned in a speaker card and you would like to speak, we please ask that you do so now and please provide it to staff. When you do come up to speak, we ask that you remember to pull the microphone close to you and state your name clearly. Uh, Jack Finnata, please. I'd like to remind you that you have three minutes, and when the light turns yellow, you are down to 30 seconds. With luck, I won't even come close to three minutes. My name is Jack Panetta. I'm at 165 Euclid Avenue in Los Gatos. Two disclosures, I live on the south side of Los Gatos and I use Highway 17 at Highway 9, uh, or I enter and exit Highway 17 from Highway 9. Why I say that will come up in a minute. Uh, I do want to say I have followed the uh, Hebe hearings, um, not completely, but in, in different uh, parts. I think they did some remarkable work. Um, I think that they made some uh, brilliant decisions and discoveries along the way about the uh, housing element, and I thought they made some good, comprehensive decisions. There was some discussion about spreading the housing through uh, Los Gatos so that it was kind of balanced between north and south. And I, I started on that side myself, that I thought there should be some balance. But as I looked at Los Gatos, I think the density is much heavier in the uh, south end of Los Gatos than it is at the north end. And Los Gatos has, uh, south end has less of a capability in terms of um, streets and infrastructure to handle the traffic. Um, I did think the South Bay and the North 40 were perfect sites. I thought the Los Gatos Lodge was a very poor choice uh, for high density, mainly because there's just not much room for um, entering and exit, exiting traffic to Highway 17. I believe that Higgins will be tough, but I like it uh, in part due to its proximity. But again, my favorites would be South Bay and North 40. 
given the amount of the thorough uh, analysis by the advisory board, I would encourage the approval of the housing element. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Do we have any questions? No? Thank you. Next is Maria Risto. Hi, Maria Risto, 85 Broadway. Um, I was also a member of the, I was a member of the Housing Element Advisory Board, and I was here for the study session um, the other week. I would just want to emphasize that um, with the information that you received from the um, Housing Element Board, you saw where we started and where we ended and understand that that was more than a year process with a lot of discussion with staff, HCD, and an evolution that went from initially talking about taking 57 units from the North 40 and going to a recommendation to earmark 364 units on that um, housing element. Sorry, I need to think this through. So. My cons our, the initial concern was if you talk about 57 units, those 57 low-income units will only be built if approximately 364 units get built. So the thought process was, let's take credit for everything that can be built there. The North 40 will eventually get built. We don't know how, but earmarking it now, if the specific plan goes through, and you have no control over that right now, and if 364 units go through, with the plan that you have in front of you, that takes care of a good chunk of the housing that we're required to plan for. If the specific plan is not approved, then there's a step that can be taken and another site can be identified, an AHAS site. Or if more housing gets built at the North 40, that doesn't really help us. We get the 364. If less does, if it gets approved to 200, then another site needs to be brought up. But right now, just understand that the housing element went through a lot of concern over gee, if we pick the North 40, are we saying that it's going to pass? It's not. It's a completely different process. This is not tied to the specific plan. This is just a plan, and let's see how things unfold, and there's contingencies. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? No? Jeff Lofridge. Hi, my name is Jeff Lockridge, 109 Paseo Laura. I'll be speaking tonight not only as a resident, but also as a member of the Housing Element Advisory Board. And first I'd like to say that when we talk about the housing element, we need to be very clear that we are not talking about the specific plan. It's easy to confuse the two, but they are completely separate. I would like to speak in support of the Housing Element Advisory Board's official recommendation. From my involvement, not only as a member of the advisory board, as well as my involvement with our previous housing element, I can categorically state that this issue is very complex. One of the many reasons it's so complicated is that since the last housing element, the state has changed a few of the rules. Previously, we only had to plan, not build, 619 units. And even though that still sounds the same now, since we only have to plan, not build, the outcome will be much different. The state has forced Los Gatos to remove many constraints which will likely result in real developments, not just plans. The restructured Affordable Housing Overlay Zone, AHAS, which we used almost exclusively in our previous housing element and its effect on our town had to be rethought. Actual rezoning as opposed to just using the AHAS was now an option on the table. The months of hard work that we have done over the past year on the board have resulted in a recommendation. At our first meeting, there was not much consensus on anything, but we worked and worked at it. Over the next several months, we discussed and argued options, asked many clarifying questions of staff. Staff, in turn, asked questions of the HCD, which is the state agency that will ultimately decide whether our housing element is certified or not. We again reviewed and evaluated our options and how they would impact both schools and traffic. We tried to determine what made the most sense for Los Gatos. We made our best effort to suggest options that would inflict the minimum impact on the town, and we tried to maximize the results to meet the state-mandated RENA requirements. The housing element recommendation is to utilize the housing units already approved or built 
secondary units, units from the residentially zoned Oka Road sites, units on the Oak Rim Ahaz property, and units on the North 40. It comes down to weighing the risk that the town is willing to take. Either a proven option that might result in a process risk if one or more of our recommendations fail to produce the proposed development, versus the real risk that Los Gatos will face with developments that will severely impact our traffic situation around the existing schools. Please don't throw away all our hard work. Support the housing element advisory board's official recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? No? Angela Derner. Hello, I'm Angelia Dorner, a proud resident of the Almond Grove. And um, I just really have three questions that are still going around in my mind that I want to share with you and hope that somehow your discussions after the public testimony um, can address some of these items. Um, primarily, I'm referring to item two on the agenda. And if you look at the uh, current table, the proposed table, I'm just wondering how the allocation between the um, very low, low, moderate, all on North 40 are going to be accommodated. I mean, you're looking at basically 93% of those units being moderate to lower than moderate housing. And the original, I thought, in the EIR, the revised DRI, ERI that was attached to the agenda um, showed, I think it was section 1.44, said that the current overlay is 20%, um, minimum of 20% moderate and below. But this recommendation is 93% moderate to low. And I'm just wondering how that, how that gets, uh, gets handled at North 40, how the developers make that work um, and still make it fiscally possible. Um, so that is a, a huge question that I have. The other is um, uh, in relation to those numbers, everyone talks moderate to low, but if you look at the page two of that same item two, um, those same units we're talking about very low being a family of four of $53,000 income. And so if you start dovetailing those dollar amounts into 93% of these units being for family of fours, those concepts, below that, I, I just have a hard time seeing how we can justify that or how it will ever be accomplished. Um, the other question I have is how the density bonuses will be dealt with if council comes through and decides that there's less than 364 units, the developer will probably just tag on these density bonuses that could even exceed what he's building uh, on top of the 364. Is that how he may recoup some of the uh, responsibility of developing all of these lower income um, units. So those are some of the bigger questions. I also had final question on how the uh, remaining AHAS sites are going to be rezoned or left alone. Um, we're referring to one AHAS site in this particular recommendation. I guess there's, I, I don't remember how many, there's four, maybe five others. I'm wondering what the proposed um, changes to our existing code and overlays are um, going to be handled. I didn't really see anything in here that said that would be reversed or changed. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Any questions? No? Thank you. I do not have any additional speaker cards. So we're now going to close the public portion of the public hearing and ask if any of the commissioners have any questions of staff, conversation, or would like to venture a motion. Commissioner Talis for? Um, the last speaker had some had two questions, and I'm wondering if Ms. Pervetti or could address that, those questions. Thank you. Certainly. So um, the first question had to do with the distribution of the housing units across the different income categories in Table 4 which is on um, 
page four of your staff report. And essentially, for the North 40 specific plan, we anticipate that the density of the housing will be at least 20 units to the acre. And for state housing element purposes, that is considered affordable housing. So we have discretion in terms of how we wish to distribute those housing units. And so given that all 364 units was the, was the recommendation of the Housing Element Advisory Board, we plug them in accordingly in order to meet um, the distribution of the income requirements. So it was just a simple math exercise. How that translates into what a developer ultimately builds is an unknown, but we don't need to worry about that right now because this is a plan for housing and how this happens will be the subject of future applications and future decisions, uh, both before you as well as the, the town council. Um, I, do you want me to entertain the question? Yes. Oh, no, I, she, there was another question. I think there was a follow-up on that. Right. Yes, there is a follow-up, but I did okay. have a, qu a question with what you just said, because there's this uh, rezoning, uh, this is at the North 40, it's on page 5 of our staff report, it's a rezoning of 18.2 acres. What do we do with the point two? Well, again... That become um, open space? <laughs> well, again, we, the entire specific plan area is about 44 acres, um, and some of that property is already zoned for residential use. So, f again, for purposes of the housing element, we need to identify the minimum amount of land at a density of 20 units to the acre to yield the 364. So that's why there's the point two. It may be that we only need 17 acres and maybe the density is higher, um, but we need a, approximately 18.2 acres. And so I think then the follow-up question was um, the remaining a uh, AHA sites and how they would be rezoned. Right, and that's, that's a really good question. And the Housing Element Advisory Board had quite a bit of discussion about should the overlay be pulled off of those other sites? Should there be additional code changes to um, the municipal code to have clarity around those sites? And after much discussion, uh, that it was decided that those would be future actions for the council to consider. Um, it's possible that the council, I, they'll need to weigh the pros and cons of that, in other words. So there are perhaps advantages of keeping them on the books uh, especially as we uh, still go through our housing element and our specific plan process, we may need a replacement site. So there, one advantage might be here's a bank of possible replacement sites. The disadvantage, of course, is that there, are, there may be um, development pressure to move in and start building on those AHAS sites now before the AHAS gets pulled off. I do want to um, assure the commission, though, that the uh, Housing Element Advisory Board was very clear that the only site that would have the change in the affordability restrictions and the code would be the Housing Element site of Oak Rim. And so all the other affordability uh, restrictions for the remaining AHA sites would, would, would essentially remain in place. And so far, the market has demonstrated that um, they, they aren't able to, um, to perform at those levels. So that will be a future decision for the council if the Planning Commission has a recommendation um, as to those other sites. That could be part of your recommendation to the full council. Uh, it is, um, it's a complex issue all by itself, so I would um, advise that we focus primarily on the housing element, and if we're able to get through that piece, if you have, if there's additional time given your other agenda items, then uh, maybe we can consider other follow-up. Commissioner Hansen, then Commissioner Kane. I just had a follow-up. Um, question for you to help answer Angela's question. So, you know, if I heard you correctly, um, the HCD, which is, has the responsibility for certifying the housing element, um, is going to primarily look at the fact that we had so many units zoned 20 in a density of 20 dwelling units per acre. So the North 40 specific plan gets approved a couple years down the road or whatever happens, and it turns out that, that um, 
that 75% of the units are above moderate, the HED isn't going to come back and say, you put these in the wrong bucket and you have to re-look at things. That's right. So, so I just wanted you to confirm that because yes. I think that's what people were worried about. Okay. Right. It's the density that's driving the affordability so for housing long, element. So purposes. as long as the North Forty specific plan is approved with 18.2 acres zoned at 12, 20 dwelling, dwelling units per acre, it's irrelevant what income categories that Right. It happens for purposes of the housing element. Um, and we will be doing, um, you know, if, if and when development occurs there, then we would be doing annual reports back up to the state in terms of how did we actually do in terms of meeting housing in those different income categories. Okay. And then I, I was hoping you could answer um, Angela's third question as well about the density. You know, would like it were the development proposal to come up with less units, would it be likely that the developer would? Um, wanted to take advantage of the density bonus. So I, I can't speak for um, a developer because I don't know, you know, what they're considering well, the from a um, business perspective, but I think it's um, entirely possible and uh, perhaps reasonable that if the council were to reduce the number of housing units that the specific plan could accommodate, that they would um, try and make that up through density bonus uh, in one form or another. But that's, that's a totally separate topic and really more hypothetical. Well, um, let me ask the question for the benefit of everyone. My understanding is that under no circumstances can we count density bonuses towards our arena numbers. That's absolutely correct, and thank you for putting that on the record. Uh, Commissioner Kane, did you still have a question? I don't have a question. Okay. okay. Commissioner Bondami? Uh, you mentioned giving annual reports to the HDC, but once we get certified, we're good for eight years, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Erickson? So I have a, a question about the wording of Action HOU 1.7 and H -O, Action HOU 2.2. .2. And while I understand the difference between one of them is talking about a development and one of them is talking about the potential development of the Oak Rim site. In the wording of 2.2, of it contemplates, um, it has an if statement. If in, if in fact it doesn't, if in fact the town approves a development which doesn't meet these things, then the town will take these subsequent actions. In action HOU 1.7, it just says, it, it declares that the town, in fact, is going to rezone that area. So my, my question is, um, does that become a presumptive requirement of the specific plan? And is it because, it's, because it, it, isn't, it isn't conditional? at least my reading of it, it isn't conditional. It is, it's pretty prescriptive. And is that presumptive um, with respect to the specific plan? And should the wording not be that? I mean, so, I mean, you understand my question. It's like, it, it, it seems to me the present wording of it makes it a presumptive requirement of the specific plan. Yeah. So um, for housing element purposes, uh, this was one of the specific comments that we got from uh, the Housing uh, and Community Development Department in Sacramento. They said they needed to see a definitive action regarding the rezoning of property for um, the specific plan. It's not presumptive. It's essentially saying that it is an action item that's in our housing element. As we know, our town council is now deliberating the specific plan. If they choose in their wisdom to do something less than 364 or less than 20 units to the acre, then the same language essentially from 2.2 would also pertain to this action item, even though it's not explicitly stated. They would still need to find a replacement site to meet the balance of the requirements. Okay, so I, I follow you. Okay, so why would it not be better to include that language now? Um, again, you know, we're 
it's probably more of an oversight that there wasn't the parallel language in all of the um, all of the items. You know, all, similarly, we didn't necessarily need to put it in 2.2 because it's assumed that if we don't achieve the density there either, we would have to find a replacement site. So, you're right. The parallel construction for the two action items should be the same. And if that's your recommendation, you know, that's an edit that we could certainly add. No, I guess I just I just didn't want us to trip over that in consistency with HCD is the only is is the reason for asking the question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So it just depends on, but I defer to your judgment about whether that's important or not. Thank you. Commissioner Kane. With the chair's permission and only with the chair's permission, I'm wondering if I can be permitted to apply the Leonardus principle to this question. Uh, two weeks ago, um, town council had an elephant, and it was an issue that was huge, and they wondered if they'd get out within a week. Um, and what uh, Councilman Leonardus proposed was an upfront motion to approve uh, the question before them and then go through it piece by piece and entertain uh, any amendments that would be forthcoming. I think that would give us a roadmap and, and uh, would be a way for us to eat this element. And by the way, I spent a number of hours last re week reading this, this tomb, um, and it took me longer than War and Peace for the clarity of War and Peace. This was very difficult. But I, I sincerely appreciate the effort by our commissioners who worked on this committee and Mr. Lockridge and others who worked on this committee because I think they produced a grade A product on a very, very difficult and potentially controversial subject. Um, in particular, Commissioner Hansen, who schooled me on this matter. I did talk to her at length about this, and she gave me the, the Menlo Park fact sheet which I think every citizen concerned with this issue ought to read. There was a movie with Denzel Washington where he said, explain it to me like I'm a six-year-old. And this does. And it tells us what we have to do, what can happen if we don't, and it gives us ways and means to get that done. So going back to the original and hearing no objection from the chair, I'd like to make a motion. Well, the chair hadn't had a chance to speak. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that would be a great idea. Are you ready to make a motion? Yes, I am. All right, Commissioner Kane. I recommend that we, I make a motion that we recommend to the town council that it adopt the housing elevated, element associated general plan amendment application GP 14002 and the addendum to the general plan final EIR and to include in that um, recommendation that they adopt the recommendations from the Housing Element Advisory Board, the four points that are attached to staff's memorandum. All right, thank you. Do we have a second? Commissioner Talisor? I will second that motion. Um, and when I second that motion, I'd also like to thank the committee for an absolute amazing job of such a complex issue. I'm still grappling with some of the some elements of it. But um, for you all to stick with it for that long, for over about two years, I think it was. And also I want to uh, uh, thank and applaud the public that came forward and had um, their, their voice heard as well. I know that everybody working together accomplished this, so I will gladly second this motion. Thank you. I think that's a sentiment that we all agree with. Commissioner Erickson? So just a, a question for the chair. I had, I had an additional question or two of the staff, but I was trying to be courteous to other planning commissioners and not roll out all the questions at one time. So is, is the other, are the other questions moved at this point in time? No, absolutely not. I think that we were looking to have a motion, and now we'll start going through the points of discussion based on the motion. So if you have additional questions, comments, please make them. So in the existing... So in the existing housing element, there's a goal HOU7, which is, sets, a, sets a goal for the jobs, household, housing balance 
in the town, their, that goal was eliminated in this draft, and I don't have a recollection, even though I sat on, sat on the Housing Element Advisory Board, about why that was eliminated as a goal. Mr. Erickson, if, you, if you're looking at a specific page, would you mind sharing that? <laughs> With us. Well, no, it's that goal is in the is in the existing housing element plan, oh, and it's not referenced in here. At yeah, all. so that's okay. the the question is, why did we not have a goal about uh, job household ratio in this plan? It's just I don't remember us specifically eliminating that kind of a goal because the rest of the goals are essentially the same. The act, the, some of the policies have been modified and some of the actions have been modified and we talked through all of those. We're gonna need to do a, a little bit of uh, research on that one for you. It wasn't, I think that was probably an early text edit that occurred um, early in the process. So I, I don't think, I don't recall it being discussed in the last 11 months of the process. So it was, may have just been a cleanup simply um, from uh, from the prior housing element. We can check the general plan because currently goal HOU7 pertains to uh, green building and energy conservation practices. So it may have been that our general plan had changed. And so that goal was, was different. There may be others who have better recollection than I. Um. Like Commissioner Erickson, I didn't think it should be admitted from the housing element. Um, in fact, um, one of the recommendations from the Housing Element Advisory Board was, um, and I might have been the one who made the recommendation, is that our our, um, our ratio is out of line with what's expected, you know, and normal and typical in the Valley. Um, and so the recommendation in this uh, motion is to have the town council consider it, but to not even have it in the housing element is a is a I think a glaring omission that needs to be addressed because um, that is a major factor by which um, most housing elements are evaluated by the, you know, the nonprofit developers and all the, you know, grassroots groups. And we should at least be looking at it and deciding whether or not it, there's an issue. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Erickson. I guess without, for the moment, without worrying about what the origin of it, I guess I would ask the staff their professional opinion, is it a good thing to take it out or leave it in? It, you know, it's without worrying about why it's not in there for the moment. I mean, in your professional judgment, is it a good thing to leave it in or take it out? Well, professionally, being someone who studied jobs housing balance quite a bit, I would agree with the commission that it should be in there. So, Commissioner Erickson, would you like to make that a point in the motion that you would like to have that included? Absolutely. I would defer to the expertise that Ms. Provetti brings to this issue, which is quite extensive. As would we if all. everyone doesn't understand that. <laughs> all right. Is that acceptable to the maker of the motion and the seconder? Yes. Great. That's agreeable. Okay. Do we have any other yes. comments, discussion, questions? Commissioner Hansen? Um, well, I had a couple um recommendations I wanted to add to the motion. Um, one was something that came up with the Housing Element Advisory Board um, towards the end, um, and it actually came up recently in a couple of um, developments that have been submitted to this Planning Commission, um, and that is about um, addressing the need for senior housing, which is definitely a goal of the Housing Element. Um, right now, there's nothing in the Housing Element um, specifically or our residential design guidelines which encourages or requires um, single-family homes, that, especially new ones, to have um, a bedroom on the first floor. And we recently looked at a development in which case there was very few units did, and that we were told that it was, you know, intended to be marketed to, among others, to seniors. And I can't think of any senior that would want to buy a home that didn't have um, the master bedroom on the first floor. And, um, and so I wanted to bring up that I think that the housing element um, needs to be modified with a more specific goal, and perhaps the residential design guidelines as well to strongly encourage, if not require, um, new development, new um, single family homes to have a master bedroom on the first floor. So if the maker of the motion would be willing to consider adding that, I'm, that's one recommendation. Should I let you? Let can, I, can I ask you a question before we go there? Are you specifically saying if it's uh, 
new homes that are being built that are being designated as senior housing have a master bedroom on the first floor? Are you saying any? Well, since since it's been well identified in many, um, and it's also specified in the housing element that the majority of the needs are going to be for senior housing going forward in the next eight years, um, I th I'm saying all single family homes should be strongly encouraged if at least strongly encouraged to have the master bedroom on the first floor. Because it's not just seniors, it could also be people that have dis, um, disabilities or other issues. Um, you know, I, 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 I lived in Texas for any number of years and you could not find a house where the master bedroom was not on the first floor. And so I'm saying that I think we should at least have a strongly encouraged language in the housing element for that, if not explicitly in the residential design guidelines. But I'd leave it up to, to staff and, and council would have to consider this as well um, to take what form it should take. I, I think personally I could um, understand and encouraging, but I think you're going to have a lot of parents that would maybe come and look at homes that don't want a master bedroom and then the other bedrooms upstairs. So I don't think we could place it as a requirement, but I could see it being an encouragement, particularly in, in dwellings that are designated as senior housing. Okay. Would that be an acceptable way to state that with the motion? Um, that would work for me. Okay. Does the maker of the motion and the seconder agree with that? We're making recommendations to, to council. Yes, and, this is just and recommendations. Whether it's lawful, you know, if it fits in the code, um, it, I think the heart is in the right place, okay. and I would uh, I would accept that um, uh, addition to the motion. Uh, and I, I and I would uh, I think it has merit. I've thought about that myself. Um, it certainly would, I think, fit in some kind of a phrase that would be encourage a variety of, you know, uh, plans that might include or could include. You know, I think that we need to do that. Okay. Commissioner Arison, you look like you had a comment about that. I, I guess it seems to me that that if, I, I think it, the idea has merit, it seems to me it, it belongs in the residential design guidelines, not in the housing element. And we have some other HEB, HEAB recommendations to consider, and I would be much more comfortable adding this as one of the recommendations and not inserting it as a specific action item or something in the housing element, but as, a, as, a, as one of the other items that one would consider. My motion was to recommend this to council along with the other recommendations. And that's how I understood it. All right, any other comments? Commissioner Badami, you didn't? Commissioner Erickson, you do. Okay, then, then I misunderstood Commissioner Kane's motion. I didn't interpret Commissioner, Commissioner Kane's motion to include those other items, but did it? It did, okay. it included four those four items. Okay. Yes, yes it, it does. Commissioner Hansen? And I had an additional recommendation on top of the he recommendations, and that is um, relative to the AHAs. Um, in light of all the comments that happened, you know, having said on the um, housing element advisory board, um, it, it became clear during all the discussions that um, that that the housing element or the, the affordable housing um, overlay zone didn't necessarily. Uh, Accomplish the intent that it really meant, it, meaning that the the trade-off between having housing um, dispersed across the town versus having a, a, you know another two or three hundred units um, in in the Los Gatos Lodge area um, was a real issue, which caused the Housing Element Advisory Board to change its recommendation. Um, that being said, um, I know the Housing Element Advisory Board did talk about the AHAs and opted not to make a specific recommendation about. What to do with it, and as it stands right now, you know those uh, remaining four sites would continue to have the 100%, um, you know, affordability requirements on um, on all of the four remaining sites. But the the point is, I, I think that we need to add to our recommendation um, to ask town council to send the AHAs back to the general plan committee um, to look at it and decide: a, do we still need the AHAs given that we've satisfied the housing element? B, um, do we want to keep those sites in there? And C, do the guidelines and requirements, for example, do we want to have single family homes as a housing type and, and so forth? I think that 
that we should ask, recommend to the town council that along with what was already in the HEAP recommendation that the entire AHAS program be looked at by the general plan committee to make sure that that's what the intent was and what we wanted because things have changed since it was established. There's no specific recommendation about how to change it. It's just to send it back to the general plan committee given the adoption of the housing element to, to look at that. Would the maker of the motion consider that? I'd like some feedback from staff on that. Is it practical? Is it warranted? I think in light of the community discussion uh, at the Housing Element Advisory Board, I think sending it back to the General Plan Committee is an excellent idea. That is the purpose of the General Plan Committee. They already have a significant background in AHAS, so I think it would be a great place to start. The community would be welcome to participate in that process, have opportunity for public comment, provide letters, et cetera. And I appreciate how the questions were stated as questions and not necessarily, um, you know, it leaves it open for that conversation to happen with appropriate action um, later to come before both Planning Commission and Council. So I, I, think it's, I think it's a fine recommendation. Great, thank you. Then I would find the addition to the motion that I made um, acceptable. What, the second of the motion? Uh, yes. <laughs> Do we have any other comments, Commissioner Erickson? So, I'll be supporting the motion, but I'd like to make some comments for the record if, with the permission of the chair. So during the last several years that I've served on the Planning Commission, I brought to the commission a keen interest in housing issues, and in particular, how affordability of housing plays a major role in shaping the composition and character of a community and is an important indicator of the values of a community. I've um, been keenly aware, and, and with the help particularly of the staff, of the critical role that housing plays in developing a sustainable community and supporting employ employment growth. And it's really critical for the planning of housing and transportation to be carefully coordinated. Um, because of my keen interest in it, I've made it my business to really learn a lot about this issue. So I've studied the government codes, I've studied the density bonus law, I've studied Senate Bill 75, Senate Bill 50, I've tracked, I they have spent a considerable amount of time understanding ABEG's methodology, understanding the role of the department of, of HCD and so forth, and looking at programs that support affordability, housing, looking at affordability indexes and so forth. So I, I bring all that to my, I brought all that background and experience to the considerations of this. And the, this, uh, this review of the housing element presented a tremendous challenge and opportunity to the town of Los Gatos. The challenge was to meet the state law requirements, to meet what I would call the letter of the law. And with great staff assistance and a lot of community input, and a lot of hard work by the Housing Element Advisory Board, we have before us a proposal that meets the letter of the law. The compelling argument for me to pull the AHAS sites out of it was not about traffic, was not about school impact. The compelling argument were made by our friends from Grosvenor, Summerhill, and Eden Housing about if we were to re retain those affordable housing overlay zones and reduce what we needed to reduce, we would create an unlevel playing field for the development of it. That was the major concern and the major driver for me to support the plan which is in front of us, even though it stands in stark contrast to the discussions in the last general plan element, the last general plan update and housing element, 
the, rev the latest revision to the below market price housing and the AHAs, which all reflected a clear community value of don't ghettoize affordable housing in this town and put it all in the same place. So, we've, so I, I had to weigh that very carefully. Um, and since this was really about meeting the letter of the law and that challenge, I can support it. That being said, I do that reluctantly when I think we missed an opportunity as a town as we go forward. And that was the opportunity to think creatively about how we address affordability of housing, which is a growing keen issue in the Bay Area, the Silicon Valley, and in this town. So we left essentially all the goals the same. We modified uh, some of the policies. We modified many of the action items, but those were really to meet the letter of the law. And we didn't have a very rich, if any, discussion about how do we address affordable housing in this community. So we missed an opportunity. And an opportunity that I believe will come back to haunt us. Because we won't do this again for another several years. And the problem that's acute in the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley and is becoming more acute in this community is not going to get better in the next five to seven to eight years. It's only going to get worse. So I agree absolutely with what it says in the front of the general plan and that this is a very special community. It's got very special people in it. It's got people that have accomplished wonderful, amazing things in their lives and we have not tapped into that resource to help us understand how we can accept a leadership role in addressing that the spirit and the intent of the affordability issue that if you read ABAG's documentation, you read the housing, uh, the HCD stuff, and you read the state laws, they're pretty clear about that. And if you read our own general plan, which has a specific goal about making housing accessible to all income levels, and you read our vision statement about supporting a diverse community, I believe we've missed an opportunity to engage the community in what is a key issue that will haunt us when we didn't do it. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Do we have any additional discussion? Commissioner Talis for? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we include also under the other um, HEAB recommendations, there's a paragraph that's not bulleted as a recommendation, and it would go along with um, the general plan, and I meant to tag it along with what you would, uh, is it returning this to the, anyway, it has to the general plan, and it, it, what it says is, uh, dis, the HEAP discussed the possibility of retaining a community forum to discuss housing issues and acknowledge that the existing general plan committee serve this function. I think that's a really good um, recommendation. If that, I don't know how the rest of my commissioners feel about that. <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand your question. I, if, it's not if, a question. Well, it's a recommendation that was in that's in that's in the staff report under other HEAB recommendations, but it's not bulleted. And I just wanted to make sure it was included. And maybe I can clarify. I, I think what there was discussion about setting up a separate body, a separate group right. of people. Um, and perhaps retaining the composition of the Housing Element Advisory Board because they had become so studious on this particular issue. But um, in light of the fact that the town already has a general plan committee, um, it was thought that the general plan committee already serves that community forum purpose. So that's why it's not a recommendation because we have the general plan committee. Okay. Is, does That's, that make it clear? Basically, it, it's in yeah, the general plan. Yeah, I, I understand that. that I under, it's increase. just that I was hoping that uh, th I guess we would the general plan committee then would just remind. I mean, invite citizens to their meetings. Is that? I mean, I looked. I read this as a separate, as a separate um, 
community forums that would be held, you know, sporadically. Yeah, and I think that was the intent of the individual who first brought that forward of let's okay. let's continue a, a separate community group. But again, this town is fortunate in that we already have a committee um, of people who care about our general plan, and that essentially is a community forum. And we have a very extensive uh, mailing list that has been following our housing element, and we would be happy to invite those individuals to join the or to participate um, as appropriate with the general plan committee as it continues these issues. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Kane. you didn't have anything to add? That's how I read the paragraph. Okay. As, as Ms. Prevetti described, it was a good idea that's already being served by the GPC. All right. Any additional comments or Commissioner Hansen? Um, I know this won't address the, all the wonderful things that Commissioner Erickson said, but um, one of the reasons I asked to send the AHAS um, program back to the General Plan Committee was exactly for that reason, because the, the, the entirety of the process of the Housing Element Board was um, from the get-go to satisfy state requirements. It was, there was a, in addition to the RENA, there was a couple of other um, things that we addressed early on, and, um, and then and the decision of the Housing Element Board at that time was not to take undertake a holistic review of of looking at all the needs of housing and whether all you know every piece of the housing element ad addressed that it was more to turn address the state requirements at hand. Um, it, there's at least a chance with the AHAS going back to the General Plan Committee that it could be looked at. Now there won't be any carrot or stick to do so because if the housing element is certified by the HCD and by council before that, then there won't be any pressing need to do so. But I, my hope would be that the general plan committee would take it upon themselves to look at the general plan with the needs for housing, including seniors and affordability and, and, and look at the AHAS and is that going to take us in the place that we want to go. And I would just um, say that given the current membership, particularly of our planning commission on the general plan committee, that I'm, I'm confident that the group will look um, to the spirit of providing affordable housing as well as um, to the law. So I think we certainly can uh, frame the discussion accordingly. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Kane. Uh, well, I feel I just got schooled by Commissioner Erickson. He's got depth, he's got breadth, he's got a, a, a lot to say, and I'm, I'm wondering if the motion could be amended further to give him the option of submitting um, those concerns in, in, an, in an addendum. I'm not sure I understood everything he said, um, but it sounded important. Um, and if, if we are recommending things to town council, I don't think his work should fall by the wayside because it's not in this right now. I'd like to see it summarized and submitted along with our recommendation. It was my understanding, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Prevetti, but when you first began speaking, the comment was that while we're going to make a recommendation that everyone's comments, concerns, and thoughts would also be submitted to council. Is that correct? That's correct. And if you want to strengthen what Commissioner Erickson had said, we could make that part of a motion in terms of the referral of AHAS back to GPC. So that way it's framed within that context. That's the... I would like that. Commissioner Erickson. I couldn't support the motion if it included that because... My point being is that we were very focused on the fact that we were meeting the, the letter of the law, and we did that, and we missed the opportunity, so we should just own what we did. I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I'm happy to support that motion, but we missed that opportunity, and to try to suggest in the motion that we, we did all of this because we, I mean, I mean, I didn't go into with the staff while the report says that we met 40 in, in the present cycle, we met 41% of our housing demand. We met 13% of the categories of affordable housing. That's all we met. And we missed our goal. We had a shortfall of 328 units. If we do that again, we're going to have a shortfall of 365 units in affordable housing. 
And we did that when there were housing set-aside funds from the redevelopment agencies were no longer available. And we're basing a lot of what we're doing on below market price housing fees. There's not going to be any funds to do it unless we figure out something else, unless we own that. So I don't want to water. I want the motion to stand as it is so, it, so the record is clear of what action is being taken. And if the council feels like we're not after the in spirit of the law and we're and we're not gonna make some and we're not gonna make the progress, which is pretty clear, I would suggest that we'll be harder for us to meet that thirteen percent goal in this cycle because any measure of affordability index is worse today than it was <laughs> before and it's getting worse and worse and worse as we go forward and we have less funds to do that and we we just took the easy out with the affordability. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying we did not address the underlying issue. We just checked the box and did the letter of the law. So I believe it will not be added to the motion, but we will ensure that when staff gives the write-up from this evening that those comments will be included. It's okay not to include his comments, but I would like town council to watch the tape. <laughs> All right, do we have any additional comment or can we take a vote? All right, we have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It passes unanimously. There are no Appeal rights, correct. We're now going to move on to the next agenda item. Architecture and site application S-14-080 through S-14-112, requesting approval to demolish an existing building and parking lot and construct new site improvements and 33 single family residents on property zoned zero PD, APN number 406-28039. May I have a show of hands from the commissioners who have all visited the site? Are there any disclosures of the commissioners at this time? Ms. Savage, I understand you're going to be giving us the staff report. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. The Town Council approved a planned development in October 2014. The planned development required the architecture and site applications for the subject 33 single-family homes to be reviewed by the Planning Commission, which are before you tonight. The single-family residences are a variety of three plan types and range between 2,100 square feet and just over 2,200 square feet. They include attached garages between 440 square feet and 502 square feet. Each plan type has three elevation styles and materials vary between those different styles. The Tuscan style elevations and the fence design do require further refinements and a condition of approval is included in your staff report exhibits uh, to make sure that those revisions are uh, made at the building permit stage. With your desk item tonight, the applicant did submit uh, revisions to the Tuscan elevation and the fence designs, but staff believes that further refinement is uh, still needed. The project complies with the planned development ordinance as conditioned and staff recommends approval. This concludes staff presentation and staff is available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions of staff at this time? No? Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Talisfor? Thank you. Um, Would you, would you walk us through what needs to be, you want, you, the staff thinks more needs to be refined on this uh, Tuscan home, is that right? Tuscan, Tuscan style home? That's correct. Can you please walk us through that and then I have uh, another follow-up question. Yes, if you first begin on with Exhibit 9, which is the architectural consultant report received on March 23rd, 2015. Yes. Thank you. Uh, 
page, it begins on page four. The recommendation is commenting on the use of the stone on Tuscan, the Tuscan style elevations. And then on page five, the comments regarding uh, defenses. Then if we go to the desk item, which contains exhibit 12, For plan one, the elevations haven't, have not changed. You, uh, you're, re you're referring to exhibit 13, correct? Yes, thank you. Plan two elevations. You'll notice that there uh, is an additional stone wall that's a half stone wall, so it's the lower portion that's included on some side and or rear elevations. That is the same case on uh, plan three, where they have included some low wall additional stone, which if you compare it to the full face walls or the full walls with stone, uh, it, it doesn't seem quite the intent that the architectural consultant recommended and in our professional opinion would need further refinement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, do we have any other questions of staff? Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Tellis for. Uh, along those lines, um, the consulting, town consulting architect also spoke about um, when the vinyl windows and I wanted to know if that has been agreed to by the developer. Was that in an earlier uh, report from the architectural consultant? Yes. Okay. Uh, it was, it was, uh, it was that there were, they were planning on using vinyl windows instead of vinyl wood clad windows. And the differences are, um, uh, well, viewable, I guess according to Mr. Cannon. Um, so I just wanted to know, it's on page seven of June 20th, 2014. Thank you, and I do recall the applicant providing justification for that, and I will take a moment to find that for you. That, and also um, the shutters, I think, were also in the same. He thought that there were two issues, that he thought they were issues and they should receive additional scrutiny. Yes, and I do recall us, uh, the staff speaking with the applicant as well regarding those, and the applicant does have justification for the vinyl shut shutters. And he'll come, he'll be here. To if be I could refer to that question to the applicant, that'd That's be great. Fine. Thank and you. And then um, are the material, is there a material board? Yes. Thank you. There are two binders with materials and colors, and I'll pass those around for the Planning Commission to share. Great, thank you. Commissioner Kane. Ms. Savage, on page uh, two of the consulting arborist report, it shows a total of 59 trees coming down, and elsewhere it talks about a number of trees being significantly impacted. Um, exactly how many trees will be replanted, um, and how many, um, as far as you understand it right now, uh, might be a candidate for pay in lieu of? So there are over 100 trees planned to be planted. And based on the requirements, after the proposed tree plant replacement trees, there would still be 51 24-inch box trees, four 48-inch box trees, plus a number of replacement trees to be determined for a very large tree that would still need to be replaced with an in lieu fee. And you're comfortable with that. That's, that sounds like a lot more trees going in that are coming out. 
I didn't, I didn't gather that from reading it initially. I was concerned about an excess use of pay in lieu. The town code requires replacement trees more than a one-to-one -one ratio. So replacement trees will certainly be much greater than the number of trees that are coming out. And it's based on the canopy size. So the larger the canopy size of the trees coming out, the more replacement trees are required. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Commissioner Talsfor? Um, also in the same uh, letter, June 20th, 2014, uh, there was number three, which was the planet one unit design. Do you have that in front of you? And I just was curious if... Are you referring to the windows at the enclosed front porch? Uh, well, all of it. Was this addressed? The applicant did address it to the best of their ability, and it does include uh, the front porch, uh, the stone on the curve of the garage, as well as the amount of garage uh, that takes up the front facade. Is that, is, can we, you refer to that in, in our plans? Would it, sure. be, would it be in our plans? Yes, one moment, please. Thank you. So the first part of the recommendation on page six of the June 20th report is to provide in a photo of other homes that they had with a similar front facade. And I will put those on the overhead in just a moment. The other part of the recommendation was to open up the front entry porch. And if you go to sheet A 1.0, it contains all three elevation, front elevations for plan one. And you'll see to, to the right of the front entry arch to the somewhat enclosed porch, there is a window and the applicant did attempt to increase the size of that to create a more front uh, open appearance. The third part of the recommendation was to eliminate the corners in the stone facing over the garage. And that was for, I believe, elevation B. Uh, but all of the curved uh, corners are removed from plan one elevations. OK. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Staff? All right. All right, seeing none, we're now going to open the public portion of the public hearing and give the applicant an opportunity to address the commission for up to five minutes. Um, however, I don't have a speaker card from the applicant. Are you the applicant? Are you going to speak this evening? So why don't you go ahead and come on up and speak, and then when you're finished, if you could please uh, fill out the speaker card and give it to staff. You have five minutes to address us. When the light goes yellow, you have 30 seconds. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Chair, it's Mark Tersini, uh, formerly KT Properties, now referred to as KT Urban. I am the applicant of the, of the project, and I will fill out a speaker card for those of you uh, that have not, uh, I, I was going to say, have the pleasure to, to meet me, but to be introduced to me in, in prior uh, meetings. I have been working on this project um, for a, a couple of years now, and uh, along with me this evening uh, is the architect, uh, the Dolan Group, both Don Ruthroth and Doug Cummings are here this evening, along with our civil engineer, Sue Dillon, and our landscape architect, uh, Paul Reed, with Paul Reed and Associates. We also have Beverly Bryant uh, along with me this, this evening, and Beverly handled our uh, neighborhood uh, outreach efforts that we made throughout the, uh, the project. And um, so I, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, short and, and, and leave it for those that have some questions for us with respect to the uh, staff report and the, the comments that were made by Commissioner Talis for this evening. I appreciate staff's uh, work on this project. I want to give it an opportunity to thank staff. 
uh, for their uh, diligent work on the project throughout its uh, iterations because there have been a number of iterations uh, for the project uh, starting off way back when with a, with a affordable housing overlay zone project uh, to Commissioner Erickson's uh, comment all the way to the project you have in front of you this evening. But uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort for, on staff, not only senior staff, but uh, with uh, uh, Jennifer Savage's efforts uh, of late to, uh, to work with us on the comments. To address Commissioner Talaforce's comments with respect to the consulting architects, um, comments that you've seen, we're, we're basing our responses now to the, the most current March uh, date letter that we have from the consulting architect. Each time that we received a letter, and we have, I believe, three of them on the project, we took the opportunity to set up a meeting with the consulting architect and the design team so we could understand fully what his uh, comments were uh, for the project, whether or not it was uh, um, the stone detailing, whether or not it was the fence detailing, whether or not it was the pitch of the roof or the, or the setbacks of the garage front door. So each time the consulting uh, architect and our architect, the Dolan Group, Don Ruthroff, Doug Cummins, would address those comments uh, line item by line item. And what we've been able to do is refine the project now down to the most current letter that you have in front, which is now down to uh, stone detail on the Tuscan elevation, of which we have since sent additional information to staff for their review. And I'm understanding this evening that staff is looking for us to do some additional refinements for that particular elevation and additional refinements for the fence detail. Um, the fence detail, there was some question whether or not it was an unpainted uh, fence. Uh, we're proposing a stain grade uh, fence material that we believe is complementary to the elevations of the home. But that's an effort that is, is done in joint cooperation between our landscape architect and our um, uh, architect for the homes themselves. And they're interfacing each other and, and discussing what does that fence detail want to look like. And we've come up with a fence detail that we're very comfortable with, with a stain grade material. But that could be uh, another material, another type of fencing, if that's uh, the, the desire of the uh, commission here this evening. So I'm going to stop my comments at this uh, juncture. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Oh, sorry. Questions? Commissioner Badami? So you just addressed um, the fence issue, why you wanted to have it um, stained and, and not take up the additional comments uh, provided by the town architect. But expanding on the stone exterior on the Tuscan-style homes, why wouldn't you follow that recommendation? Well, I'd like uh, Don Ruthroff to, to address that. Don is the, the architect that is really uh, looking at those refinements and exactly how best to address Mr. Cannon's comments uh, that uh, his uh, concerns on that elevation, I'd like, like Don to step up and address that directly if I could. Sure, Thank he's you. right behind you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Commissioners. Don Ruthraff, Dolan Group Architecture Planning, Senior Associate, Senior Architect there. Uh, nice to be before you again. Uh, I don't think we were saying that we won't address those comments. Um, we're working through addressing those comments with staff and with Larry Cannon both, and I'm sure we'll come to a resolution that's amenable to everybody. I don't, I don't see a problem in finding a solution that, that fits what everybody's concerns are. I, I can't enumerate what that is tonight because I just found out they weren't happy with where we are, so I haven't sat and looked at what you know, we can do now, but we'll figure something out. Well, I mean, we've just been, we've continued to add things to the building thinking we're addressing the comments and we just haven't quite gotten there yet. So is the intent, you, you was stated that you have been taking these letters and meeting with Mr. Absolutely. Cannon. So is the intent to have a follow-up meeting absolutely. with Mr. Cannon oh, to address absolutely. these? Oh, absolutely. Of course. Okay. That's, how, that's how we get to resolution. Great. Good. Do you, any other questions? Thank you. Commissioner Hansen. Um, I'm not sure who I'm directing the question at, but um, I have a, just a general question about the target market for these 33 units, and then a follow-up question from that. I appreciate the, the question, uh, Commissioner. Uh, that is one that we are looking at. Is the It's, it's going to be a combination of um, um, 
young uh, workers, most likely uh, uh, tech workers, and also we believe that we're going to see uh, a fair amount of um, folks that are downsizing in the town of Las Gatas or maybe potentially downsizing in other communities. For instance, I received a call um, from, a, from a gentleman that is looking to sell his home in, in Saratoga. He and his wife have been in Saratoga for 40 years. Uh, he's anxious to know when can I uh, find out more about the homes. We would love to stay in the community and downsize. And I heard your comments early tonight with respect to even the uh, ground floor um, for the seniors and, and, and master bedrooms. We've designed homes like that uh, in, in the past. And what, what I believe is the homes that have been designed will be attractive to, uh, to folks that are looking to downsize. But, so it's gonna be a combination. We really look at it as young families and, and older families as well. Okay, well, then maybe you can help me because I, I read through all the plans. I mean, I, I poured over them, and, and it looked like there was an option in some of the units to put the fourth bedroom on the first floor if you chose to do so, but none, not I didn't see in any of the 33 units a specified bedroom on the first floor. Uh, so then yeah. I can't imagine why somebody downsizing would want to buy a house like that. I mean, maybe uh, I'm missing something. Right, I'm not suggesting that, the, yeah. The, yeah. The, but I'm, I'm, what I'm telling you is what, uh, what has taken place in the marketplace, and that wasn't, wasn't the only call I've, I've received. So there, there will be those that will go there, whether or not they uh, appreciate the, the style of home that we have uh, offered uh, for that is, is, is their uh, discretion, obviously. Um, so I, I guess that that's a concern that I have with this whole development is that it, there isn't any specified thing to really address the, you know, the downsizing market from um, older individuals um, by having the, you know, a specified bedroom in the first floor. So that's one question I have. Um, so my <clears throat> second question, I, I, um, I come from a background in the town of doing a lot of work with bike and pedestrian stuff. And um, I, I saw lots of pretty drawings but I didn't um, see a plan for the sidewalks and how um, bicyclists would be handled in the neighborhood. Um, it wasn't clear to me on the drawings where the sidewalks would be, um, and when people are driving through the neighborhood, you know, you know, how would they be mixed with car traffic and that kind of thing. So I, that, that's definitely something I would like to see more of before I could really feel comfortable, um, and especially also the bikes as well. Because if families were to buy in there, and even young professionals, um, we're hoping that more of them are going to be riding their bikes, and how is that going to work inside this neighborhood? And you kind of, I, I know the surrounding area is really busy in terms of traffic, but I think you got to start with the development itself and have places, you know, that are safe for bikes and pedestrians. Um, and then on top of that, um, I am curious also about the common areas. I saw <coughs> some pictures of the common area, um, but I didn't couldn't map them to where they were in the overall development because it seemed to me like a development like this with 33 units is the ideal um, thing for something like, you know, complete streets with nice sitting areas for people and park benches and things like that. Um, and I, I think that was the intent here, but there wasn't enough detail for me to evaluate whether it got there or not. Sure. I appreciate that. And I can bring Paul Reed up to the uh, microphone if we need to with respect to the landscape. And I'll start with the landscapes and stuff where you finished. Uh, we have a combination of an, uh, an area for, for seating and a trellis area and a lawn area for, for uh, children to play in addition to a separate uh, community garden. And we were very um, pleased with our thought process on introducing of a, a community garden from the standpoint that you really see the, the uh, desire for, for young folks, when, especially in the farmer's market here in town and other farmer's market, the popularity of those. And um, with the homeowners association, it's, it's nice to be able to have that to be able to be able to maintain and something that can uh, be uh, the, the eyes and uh, kept on that particular um, element of the project for the longevity of the, of the project. For the bicycling, and the kid and children play, you'll notice that we've introduced some um, decorative pavement uh, throughout the, the project. And the term that we originally started off was uh, a Werner uh, design. And basically that is really uh, uh, for the, the, uh, the smaller streets and for the area flow. We're not looking at the, 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 the traffic patterns come here. This is, a, this is a neighborhood that where people will know 
their neighbors, know where there's children to be played. This is not a, a drive-through uh, neighborhood. So we're looking at the combination of the, the walkways that we do have, uh, and in addition to the kids, they'll actually ride on the street. They'll ride in the street, uh, uh, along the edge of the street, obviously, but it's going to be a combination. And I'll give you a good example. When I was taking some photographs of other projects that have been completed here in the town of Las Gatas, and one that has uh, been very well received with the Villa Felice uh, project, um, beautifully done. And when I'm out and I'm, and I'm parking in a little parking stall and I'm walking down in front of these homes taking pictures of the elevations, what do I see in the street? I see three boys riding their bikes, you know, and circling around me and circling going around and there. It's very quiet. There's not much car traffic coming in and out because it's not a thoroughfare street. But I took a picture of that because it um, this reminded me that that's the type of living that we're looking for. That's the type of living I grew up with, the, you know, that we actually did play basketball in the street or we rode our bikes on the street. We're not all riding on the sidewalks. Today, just today, when I'm uh, driving in uh, uh, Cupertino and I'm coming on over here, I see a, a sign that says, you know, no riding the bike, walk the bike on the, on the sidewalk. So that's what you'll do. Walk the bike on the sidewalk, get on the street and go out and, and, and traverse out. Well, um, and that sounds great. So I, I think you're, what you're saying for the vision sounds really good, but I just <clears> didn't <throat> see it in the drawings. Okay. For example, one of the open space areas, there was pictures of parked cars in it, and I don't think of, I couldn't imagine a, an open space that I would consider a, a public meeting area that would have parked cars in it. Um, so maybe it's just the drawings that we have, um, but I, I don't feel like I can properly evaluate this from that perspective with, that, with the drawings that we got. Okay. So I'm sure I'm just not seeing it, and it's it's there because I'm hearing it from your intent. All right, Commissioner okay. Benami. Um, your descriptives about the children riding their bicycles in the street is perhaps some of us did when we were growing up. Um, this is a major thoroughfare to the hospital, so as a parent, I, I'd be very concerned about that. Having my kids ride their bikes on that road uh, with ambulances going by, etc. Uh, but I was going to ask a question about the boulder that you had in your previous exhibit when the plan development was approved, and I think we had some concerns about children climbing on that boulder. So with respect to Commissioner Hansen asking about the play areas for the children, was the boulders going to be retained? No, we're not showing the boulder. Thank you. Commissioner Talisfor. Thank you. I'm going to have to do a follow-up with your um, visit to Bella Vista. And I don't like to usually bring personal experience into this, but I happen to live on that street. So I'd like to address what you just said. And yes, the children ride their bikes on the street. And if you're me, you go 15 miles an hour down that street because you know that. Um, however, if you are teenagers who don't live there, if you are other uh, people in the, in other words, we can't control how fast people go. It is a situation, it's an issue actually. And we have sidewalks. So I'm, I, I really have a hard time with your explanation. It's, it's, it makes me really uncomfortable. And you're not taking into account the delivery trucks that have no idea about children in the street. So um, I would just like to tell you that. Anyway, that's, I, and I'm sorry to have to follow up with that, but it's, it's uncomfortable. Um, but I did have a question for the architect to follow up. May I do that? Yes, thank, thank you. you. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to know if you could address the windows and the shutters that Mr. Cannon also brought up. Um, we, we've resolved the windows with Mr. Cannon. We are providing... They are vinyl windows with um, true grids on them, so they replicate a wood window, and they have the same profile. And then the shutters are we're still working through that detail with them. We, oh. we are still we've just made a proposal. We have, we're, it's one of the few out, outstanding items that we're still trying to resolve. Okay, and I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but I, I'm quite uh, curious about it. Uh, there's 33 homes in this development, and yet you chose three plans only. And I'm, I'm quite surprised that I was sh actually shocked that I didn't see maybe four or five of a development this size. Can you explain that? 
Part of it is geometry. There's a, there's a certain efficiency to the site, and there's a certain number of ways you can solve a floor plan. These are small floor plans. That limits our number of resolutions that are really good. There's a lot of okay resolutions, and then there are several good resolutions. So we picked what we felt were the best resolutions to the size of footprint that we had available. And then I just have one more, and I'm sorry. Um, and then Commissioner Kane. Yes. Uh, I wanted to address the garage doors. In some of your plans, the garage doors are about 50% of the facade of your house, houses. Um, and in the design, our residential design guidelines, we often uh, look for a softening of those features so that they're not so, uh, something that wouldn't make them so prominent mm -hmm. as they as you face them. Have you thought about doing that? Have you checked our we did, design guidelines? We actually guidelines? did that. We, by recessing them further than we would normally, they're deeply recessed, about two and a half feet, which is way further than we would normally. Mm -hmm. They're not right on the face of the building, so you get a nice shadow line. It brings the actual architecture of the building down in front of the door and then brought the entry element to the front so that it shares that front facade and is not pushed back to soften that impact. And it is really only one house that has that. The other house has the garage in the back, and the other, garage, the other one is less than 50%. So we, we chose to resolve it once at one house that way, and then the other to better meet the guidelines overall. OK, thank you. Commissioner and Payne. just to okay. Commissioner Hansen, plan three does have a standard bedroom and bath downstairs on the first floor. Um, it was the fourth bedroom. It wasn't the master. Okay. Well, you had said bedroom, and I... No, I, I, so I, I did see that. Right. Um, okay. but, I just but, wanted to make sure that it was clear. Thank you. Yeah. No, but it, I, was, I was looking for the master. So, Commissioner Kane. Sir. Forgive me for not getting your name. I'm Michael Kane. First name is Mark. The last name is Tersini. T-E-R-S-I-N-I. Your name is the one on the signs that are posted on the property? Just should, should be. I'm usually asking, the guy that they look for. Asking right. people to come to the April 23rd, uh, 2014 meeting. <laughs> is, is that sign still leaning up against the we building? Is that what that you're okay. um, I have a concern I didn't have 30 minutes ago. Um, twice you've made reference to young people as your market and tech people and young people and 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 then I hear Commissioner Hansen saying, "Do we have any master bedrooms downstairs?" And you wouldn't be excluding seniors from the project in any way, would you? No. The A and S question we have in front of us is very narrow. Carter, um, is it too late to request consideration of master bedrooms on the first floor? That's not a requirement in any of the current documents the town has. I know as we talk through the housing element, that was one of the items that Ms. Hansen wants to uh, have addressed and the rest of the commission as well and that part of that recommendation. There's no requirement for any um, number of bedrooms, whether it's master or otherwise, to be on the ground floor. Would you consider putting any master bedrooms on the ground floor? Well, and... Uh, at this juncture, where we would uh, consider that as far as if, if, if we were to receive information from the buying public that uh, in order for them to buy the unit, they would like to see a master bedroom on the ground floor, that would be the time that we'd make a modification to the plan, but we wouldn't make the modification at this time. I would value that diversity if you could get it in there. I know the card on a &S is very narrow, so that you would consider it is probably the best I can get at this juncture. You also mentioned outreach, that you had a person who conducted your outreach, and I'd, I'd like to know um, how many neighbors were talked to and what that feedback was. Sure, I'd happy to bring Beverly Bryan up as well. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Commissioner Kane. My name is Beverly Bryant. I'm actually a resident of Las Gatas. I'm working for KT Urban on this particular project, and my commission was to uh, talk about public outreach. Um, we had a great deal of public outreach that took over, golly, a couple of years, actually. We meet, reached as many, and I had a chart. I did not bring it with me tonight, but we reached as many as 467 people. Uh, we did outreach through public meetings, meetings, excuse me, of immediate neighborhood neighbors. We invited people at 300-foot range, at 500-foot range, um, over a course of two of them, one in October 12 and one in uh, February, no, sorry, October 13 and February uh, 14, 19, um, 2014. Uh, we did, I personally walked the neighborhood, um, you know, and handing out flyers and talked to people, made um, a great number. We, we um, mailed notices to 125 in the first instance, 175 people in the second instance. Um, some of the other statistics is we talked to um, and wrote letters to the business neighbors who are across the street. As you know, this project is right across from the Dell Avenue um, business park, part of which is in Las Gatas. It's called Agato Business Park. Uh, we sat down and talked to them. We talked to virtually all of the people in the shopping center. There's a, what a, where Aldo's restaurant is. There are a number of uh, businesses there. We had coffees with them and meetings with them. Uh, we went into the um, condos, the uh, senior condos that are on Par Avenue and talked to people a couple of different times. Uh, many of them came to our public meetings that we had at the, uh, the uh, Nordahl Hall, which is right in that area. Uh, and we, I cannot tell you how many of the phone calls that I made personal phone calls to talk to to people about the project, answering them, writing letters to them and notes and so on. Uh, at the two public hearings that were held, um, uh, the Planning Commission hearing and the Council hearing, we had, I think, a number of people, upwards of 25, who came and spoke in favor of the project. There's one neighbor here today. Um, I think she's still here. There she is, um, who came out tonight. And there was another gentleman in the in the desk item, as you saw, that came out twice. So we really felt that we uh, talked to people. Uh, one man uh, wanted to know about the site. We walked it with him. We brought a traffic engineer and a tree, not a tree engineer, but we talked about you know the, the site with him. Uh, and two or three of times, we met with neighbors. Well, it sounds like an outstanding job. Thank you. Well, thank you. We we really just to just to just wrap it up. Uh, we understand how, as a resident of the town, and I've been here for almost 30 years, I understand the importance of communicating your plans and doing what you say you're going to do. And I think that's what this project is all about. Thank you for asking the question. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? All right. So we're now going to invite comments from members of the public. I have three speaker cards. Uh, when you come up, please make sure that you pull the microphone to you, state your name clearly. You'll have three minutes. When the yellow light comes on, you're down to 30 seconds. The first is Suzette Austin. Good evening. My name is Suzette Austin. 19 years ago, I moved from Los Gatos into a home in a development built by KT Properties, now KT Urban. Um, it is off of Capri Avenue, less than a mile from the proposed Knowles Drive site. My house is a quality house. All aspects met or exceeded what was promised to us, and it's a home I'm proud of today. I'd like to also mention that in our master bedroom, we had it modified, so it, basically the plan showed two bedrooms and we had it all made into one bedroom, and that was no problem at all. This is a quality project. I think that almost anything would be better than the abandoned building and the chain link fence that's there now. I strongly recommend that you once again give final approval to this project. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Um, actually, I do. 
Um, just to, as we've had some discussion on modifying for a bedroom or whatever, at what point were, did you make the modification? As you chose the home prior to the design of it, or were you in the home and then had the modification made? No. It was actually, the house had fallen out of escrow, and then my husband and I bought it, and it was still being constructed. So even though they had started construction on it and framed out the room, they took one of the walls out of it and added a closet in it for us so that instead of having a master bedroom and a fifth bedroom, we have four bedrooms and a very large master bedroom. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Lee Cantata. Lee Quintana, Five Palm Avenue. Um, I had not planned on speaking tonight on this item, so I'm maybe not going to be so fluid. Uh, I would just like to comment on a couple of things. In our um, zoning code, the PD zoning uh, indicates that there should be excellence in design. Uh, this already has an approved site design, and you're here for the ANS, which includes architecture. And I am not an architect, but looking at these plans, to me, they're very flat, they're very boring. Um, and that's just my opinion as a layperson. When it comes to the issue of uh, move down housing, which was mentioned, I am a senior. I live in a two-story house. I would never buy another two-story house as a move down for a senior. And in fact, these houses are larger than my home, so they couldn't be a move down anyway. So th those are just two things. And, and I guess I also want to make the comment that I've always assumed that even if you've approved the PD zoning, you do have a little bit of flexibility at architecture and site in terms of the architecture, as long as you're not conflicting with the PD. Um, and I don't see that what was being suggested or asked in terms of bedroom, uh, master bedroom on the first floor for at least some units uh, would be in conflict with the, with the PD, it just isn't specifically stated in the PD itself, but uh, it would be the same as saying, well, the PD didn't say that you could make one bedroom out of two, but it wouldn't violate a PD to do that. Thank you. Questions? Commissioner Kane? <laughs> I agree with the, with much of what you said. I um, I wasn't on commission first time this got went through. I've looked at the plans and I've walked the subject property, and I, I think the intensity is overwhelming. I would agree. with And you. I know that you've been a, you were a planning commissioner for a long, long time. Um, but let's get that out on the table that I don't see any way that that can be addressed tonight given what's in front of us. We have a simple ANS and the intensity and the density and the everything else has been covered by the PD. Which process needs improvement? Which process we hope they're working on improving as we speak? But what can I do about that tonight? Again, my philosophy when I was a commissioner, as you said, was that uh, it, if there is nothing you can do about an ANS application as it comes before you, why is it coming before you? That it makes it non-discretionary. It makes it simply a, a permit that you're approving. Um, and I don't think that's the intent of an ANS. Thank you. But that's my personal p opinion. Thank you. Jeff Lockridge. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Jeff Lockridge, 109 Paseo Laura. Um, I'm also, um, well, I'm a 37-year resident of Los Gatos, and I'm quite familiar with that area because my brother-in-law lives at Villa Vasona, which is just directly behind this development. And it's, um, it's Section 8, and, behind, and beside him is on Par Avenue, both of these are on Par Avenue, is the open door facility, which is also HUD housing. And I have to say that, in my opinion, and I'm not an architect, um, I don't think, well, I think that the, the open door look and feel is 100 times better than this, and it's HUD housing. And this, to me, looks like if this isn't affordable housing, it, sh it should be because it doesn't, it doesn't have any what I would consider articulation in the housing. It's just big, they look like monopoly houses or hotels. Um, and I don't know what can be done about it tonight, but I see, you know, and just looking through the, the documentation, seeing them slap on some, some shutters, is like, uh, okay, I guess I could have done that too. Um, so, and also, um, the entry doors, I looked at some of the, the elevations. I had a hard time finding which elevation had the entry door. Maybe that was just me, but that's what I saw. Um, and I would also say that the, the outreach having to do with 300 and 500 feet away from the, the area, <laughs> that includes Section 8 and HUD housing. So a lot of the residents that are close in on that are... Section 8 or HUD housing residents. So. Commissioner Kane. What's the, what's the significance of that? Well, uh, most of the time, the, the, well, if you have been involved with uh, Villa Vasona and the residents, half of them are Russian. The other half of them are a mix between, uh, this is, these are non-English speaking, most of them non-English speaking people. So they, they live in housing that is government subsidized, and they're going to be asked questions about whether the, the development behind them is, is uh, appropriate or they like it or not. I mean, uh, I've spoken to many of the residents there, and I, I don't know what, what information you could get from them having to do with a, a new development behind them. It's going to take away their parking lot, in fact, for a lot of them that, that park there. The lady said she talked to 467 people. You, you feel the viability of that may be in question? I, I think that 467 is quite a bit, and I don't know that the, the, there was a consensus of all those people. I mean, talking to a lot of people is one thing, but what's the consensus back? What, what did people say? I know a lot of people were against that, and they, they fought against it until um, at the town council meeting when it got passed, it got passed in kind of a strange way, but anyway, um, it, it got passed. And then those people stopped fighting because it was just a done deal. But there were a lot of people against it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Thank you. I don't have any other speaker cards for this item, so we're going to provide the applicant up to three minutes to respond to the comments and questions that were just put out. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice, it's been a long afternoon. Um, I, I, unfortunately, uh, sometimes I don't think the uh, commission has the benefit of a some of the colored renderings that we are able to produce and when sometimes when it gets distilled down to the packages, when I see the package that comes out um, the, with, with the staff report, and it's not any criticism at all of staff, it's just, it's just the, the, the nature of the beast. It's when you take drawings um, that have been produced, professionally produced, and then you distill them down and keep producing them and co copy, and they don't quite have the same effect. But I wanted to um, touch on the architecture. And the architect, the Dolan Group, was selected specifically uh, for their expertise in design and quality design. Uh, this is not just a, a startup firm that's uh, first whack at trying to do uh, uh, projects. They do projects in all the way from extremely high-end uh, custom homes uh, to multifamily housing to 
apartments to senior housing. And we work together. This is not just hire them and then just go forward and say, just, just put, send anything out. When it comes down to the unit mix, and there's a question with respect to the unit mix, we talk about that a lot. We talk about the elevations and, 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 and the variety of the units and the mixing of the, the roof tiles from barrel tile to flat tile to the colors. Because as you work through and design the project, we're very proud of the projects that we, we build. And we will be watching this project throughout its completion and very interested in the end result of the project. You know, who's buying the project, how well received was the project, and we look at a lot of different product that the Dolan Group has, has put out before we even decided on going forward with this particular design concept. So I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that um, we're very, very pleased with the, uh, with the architecture. We're very pleased with the landscape architecture. Uh, Paul Reed has, does marvelous work uh, uh, for us over the years, many years, and has done Again, high-end custom homes to small lot uh, single-family homes. So we pay a lot of attention to that. Our civil engineer uh, has been in this valley for, uh, I want to say, 60 years uh, doing civil engineering works. So very comfortable with them. So um, I'm very pleased with this project, and I, I look for a favorable recommendation this evening uh, so we can uh, move forward on this project. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any further questions for the applicant? You're pausing, so that's why I'm not saying no. Cause... Okay, no, thank you. thank you. All right, we're now going to close the public portion of the public hearing and ask if any of the commissioners have questions of staff, want to comment on the application, or would like to introduce a motion. Commissioner Erickson? So the matter before us is an arch architecture and site applications S14080 and S14112. There are required findings that we are required to make to support a recommendation to approve those architectural site applications. And that's the matter before us tonight. It's not whether or not the town council approved an appropriate plan development. That's history now. So I'm pleased to make a motion to approve architectural site applications S14080 through S14112. And I can make the required finding for CEQA that environmental impact report was prepared for the plan development and was certified by the town council on September 16th, 2014. And no further environmental analysis is required for the proposed architectural site applications. I can also make the required finding for the demolition of an existing structure as required by section 2910-0950E of the town code as outlined in exhibit two. I can make the required compliance, the required finding that the architecture and site applications are in compliance with the plan development ordinance as adopted by the town council. Um, I can make the required finding that the um, architectural site uh, applications as proposed are in compliance with the residential design guidelines and that all the required considerations have been made in the review of an architectural site application and noting that as a part of it one is adopting the conditions of approval in exhibit three and that the consulting architect of the town has in fact reviewed the proposal and has said it is in compliance from his in his judgment with all of the guidelines for a PD and for architectural site application with the two exceptions that are covered by um, condition of approval 21 and I'm comfortable that the staff can facilitate the working of the applicant and his architect with the town's consulting architect to resolve that issue. All right, do we have a second? Do we have any discussion? Nobody has yet, so I was. We don't, <laughs> Commissioner Kane. 
Do we have a second to the motion? No, we do not. So if we do not, then... Well, I'll second the motion. I'll second the motion because we're a judicial body. We can't rewrite laws. We, we're not authorized to change town code. Commissioner Erickson is regrettably correct. We are in a narrow corridor. I don't have an attractive choice. There's no reason to beat this to death, but I'm willing to listen to opposing opinions. I just can't find them. None of these houses have backyards. And I saw it for the first time when the plans were to, and I, what is up with that? But it's too late. What we need is, is an examination of our PD process. And, and Commissioner Erickson, I believe, is correct. Any additional comment? Commissioner Talisfor? Uh, yes, I will not be supporting this motion. Um, actually, I don't find that Mr. Cannon uh, did support this 100%, and that's really what I was looking for, especially in a uh, development with this dense uh, of, of building. Um, he asked in his June 20th uh, letter, and I think this is really important because I was very disappointed to see that this was not happening. But what I'm concerned about in the, such a dense and compact community that is being developed here is that the massing is, is out of human scale almost. And in Los Gatos, besides the rich architectural details that we look for, and the models are the three models that are relatively new, Bella Vista, Laurel Muse, and Bluebird, compact but rich in detail. But what's missing, uh, as he asked here for, he gave the option to the, uh, to the firm of requesting a greater variation in A, B, and C elevation massing and articulation. And basically what's been happened here is that we have flat, flat fronts and things added to the front, which doesn't really help the massing at all. So that's one reason that I, I won't be supporting it, because I don't believe that all of the um, suggestions that Mr. Cannon had articulated with you have been addressed. And, and also, I wouldn't approve this without seeing a final design, and you're still working through issues. And I'm not going to approve something I can't see. Commissioner Badami? That was my concern as well, that it's come before us. This should be the final product that we're deciding on. And I'm not comfortable that it will be worked on, because it should have been worked on at this point before it came before us. So I won't be supporting the motion. Um, I don't see that it's compliant with the residential design guidelines. And I'm referring to Exhibit 9, Section 3.2.2. And I, too, don't see the excellence in design. Do we have any other comments? All right, I guess we'll take a vote. All in favor? Opposed? Two in favor, four opposed. Mr. Paulson, are there any appeal rights? Well, there's not appeal rights. You need to have another motion. Has that motion failed? All right, does anyone want to make a, a motion? Um, I will make a motion. I'm not prepared to, but I will. Um, I will, uh, and I'm not sure where to go with this. I would make a motion for architecture and site application S-14-080 through S-14-112 for 375 Knowles Drive to um, continue the application in that um, that the unfinished architectural features discussed with uh, town consulting architect be uh, worked through and presented as a whole package when you do come back, uh, that um, you pay attention to the massing and see what you can do with that, because I find that, that this is, there's such a commonality that we need to um, address that, and that is what architecture and site review is here. Um, 
And okay. I think that would be it. All right. You have a second? Commissioner Badami? I'll second the motion. All in favor? Oh. I, oh. Comment? Um, if it's going to be continued and the applicant's going to come back, um, I don't know whose responsibility it is to review this, but I'm, I'm not satisfied that we have seen uh, adequate um, description of what the bike and pedestrian accommodations are going to be for the community it's, as opposed to the actual um, buildings themselves. So um, for me to want to have this continued, I'd want, and for me to be able to support it in the future, I'd need to be able to see what the detailed plan is for that. So if the maker of the motion would be willing to add that to the requirements for the continuance. Yes, I'm glad you reminded me, I will. <clears throat> and I apologize, I asked for a vote before we had a date also, so we need a date certain. And the second. I, I will go along with that. Uh, I was just gonna put it all in one and say to you. Yeah, because April 22nd, is, it'd be May 13th. May 13th is a possibility or May 22nd? Oh, it might. Or 27th, sorry, not 22nd. I think we're going to kind of, in general, look out and see if anyone gives any indication that they would be ready by the 13th. Okay. So I think we'll set it for May 13th and we'll include that in our motion as our date certain. Is that acceptable to the maker of the motion? And the yes, senator? please include the date certain. Yes. Thank you. All right. I'm in agreement. Before I t take a vote too early, do we have any additional comments? All right. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes four to two. Before we move to the next item, we're going to take a five-minute quick break, if you all don't mind. We'll be right back. All right, we're now gonna call the meeting uh, back to order. We are now gonna consider uh, the next agenda item, which is an architecture and site application S-14-076, conditional use permit application U-14-023, and variance application V-14-002, requesting approval to demolish an existing single family home and construct a new single family home with reduced setbacks on property zoned CH APN number 523-06-031. We have a show of hands of all the commissioners that have visited the site. Are there any disclosures at this time? No? Ms. Mosley, I understand you're gonna be giving us a staff report. I am, good evening. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing non-conforming residence at 16785 Magnuson Loop and to construct a new single-family residence in substantially the same location. The property is zoned CH, which makes the existing residence non-conforming, or the residential use non-conforming. The existing site contains a 1,362 square foot single-story residence, which was constructed in 1947, as well as a detached garage. The proposed new residence would be 382 square feet larger than the existing residence in order to accommodate an, a fourth bedroom. The existing garage would be retained. The proposed residence, while having a larger yet still conforming FAR, would be similar in size and massing to those in the immediate neighborhood. Due to the condition of the residence and the substantial termite damage, the applicant is proposing to demolish the existing residence rather than do an addition remodel as previously considered by the applicant. As a result, the applicant is requesting a variance in order to retain the existing non-conforming front and site along a street setbacks. It is staff's opinion that the applicant has provided the required justification to assist the commission in granting the variance application as required by town code. 
In conclusion, while the site is zoned CH, the property has contained a residence since 1947. Any addition to the existing residence would require approval of a conditional use permit for the non-conforming use. This conforms to town code and the general plan through retention of the existing housing stock. The requested variance would permit the applicant to rebuild the non-conforming setbacks with the new residence and would be appropriate given the size, location, and zone of the lot and that in contrast, conforming setbacks along the busy street corner would substantially decrease the available private open space which other properties in the vicinity enjoy. Staff recommends the Planning Commission approve the applications subject to the attached conditions. This completes staff's report. We are here if you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff? Commissioner Talisfor? Thank you. Um, my question is about the, um, the applicant claimed that the, that the house was infested with termites. Do, do, you, do you get involved in that as far as checking out that, um, following up to see if that's the reason that a remodel wasn't? So each application to demolish a single family residence is required to submit a structural condition report to either verify the, that information um, <clears throat> or provide that, that documentation. The applicant did provide that. It doesn't say that, the, that it is infested with termites, but it does document that there is a, there is a report that, ha that documents substantial termite damage. Um, that has been abated. The termites are no longer there, but the damage that they left previously in the past um, is what they're concerned about. A lot of times, it doesn't do us any good to, when they know that there is um, a history of termite damage, for them to assume that they can go with an addition remodel, go through the process, and then when they open up the walls, discover that there is above and beyond the damage that they had anticipated. So it is often encouraged when they know that there is more damage um, or the potential that there is substantial damage to kind of account for that, and that is what this applicant is trying to do through this application process. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hanson? Um, I apologize, this might be, you know, because I'm relatively new to the commission, but um, if I read the staff report correctly, if this property was actually zoned as for what it was, which is R18, um, it wouldn't have a compliance issue. Is that correct? The town code allows us to look at allowing exceptions to the requirements of the zone um, on non-conforming lots, which this would be if it were zoned R18, um, which is what the, the adjacent residential lots are zoned. Um, so we could look at providing a compatible non-conforming setback um, through just the architecture and site and not requiring a variance application. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I, I guess I, the question that was kind of burning in my mind was why, why don't we try and why aren't we fixing the zoning? Because this isn't ever not going to be a residence. And it seemed like it would be a, a smoother process if, if they ever want to do anything again. I mean, or is the, the, should I just not be bringing that up? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it is one, pro, one avenue that, that could have been considered. Um, it is not necessarily easier. Um, and it is more lengthy. Um, I'd have to look at the costs. Um, the rezoning is... Um, is definitely more costly, I think, than the applications that they pursued. Okay. Commissioner Kane. Ms. Mosley, in your discussion of variance, you included Town Code Section 2920-165, which speaks directly to um, um, uh, allowing consideration um, given the result that without it, the result would be undue hardship. I found that persuasive. Um, it's right in the town code. And yet in your recommendations, you didn't make a reference to 165. You made a reference to 170. Can you educate me as to why you left out 165 in the recommendations? The findings that you're required to make are specifically those located in 170. But I included 165 because it related to helping you get to the findings. And I felt that it provided background. But these specific findings that you need to make are 170. Thank you. So I have a quick question. Um, just to make sure that I'm clear and we're all looking at the drawings the same. If you were to look at drawing uh, A1, 
talking about the variance and stuff. I, I want to make sure I'm understanding this right. If you look on the, the bottom left, we have the outline of the existing house and the outline of the proposed new house. Aside from the fact that it looks like they're squaring out the back, they are still following falling within the same footprint or I, I guess setbacks as what they originally had because the garage is staying. Is that correct? Am yes. I reading that correctly? Okay, yes. so we're not asking for any variance beyond what the house is existing sitting on. Correct. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Real staff? quick. Yes. Just a real quick question is uh, Larry Cannon made um, several suggestions for this and in the staff report it it says that um, of which uh, details blah, 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 of which the applicant has addressed in the proposed development plans. What do you mean by addressed? So they have made those corrections that the consulting architect requested um, regarding beefing up the details, thank you. Um, particularly the front porch elements and such. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No. Thank you, Ms. Mosley. All right, we're now going to open the public portion and give the applicant an opportunity to address the commission for up to five minutes. Uh, Josephine Chang. Just please make sure you adjust the microphone so you can speak directly into it and state your name for the record. Sorry, I have a cold. Um, my name is Josephine Chang. Um, I'm the applicant. Um, I grew up in Los Gatos since the age of three. Uh, my parents still live in Los Gatos. Uh, we, my family lives in Cambrian Park right now, and we would like to move to Los Gatos and reside in this home. Uh, we have two kids, so we would like to have a four-bedroom house. Uh, and due to the constraints of the lot, there's no w place for a backyard, seeing that's on Los Gatos Boulevard and adjacent to Taco Bell. So we f figured the best way to have a yard is to uh, maintain the courtyard between the garage and the house and to uh, make it more accessible from the house by having the great room face that courtyard, which if you look at the existing floor plan, the uh, communal living space faces Las Gas Boulevard. Uh, so we did consider remodeling the house, but if you look at, there's a termite report in 2007 uh, stating there's extensive damage to floor joists and uh, ceiling joists and roof rafters, et cetera, that we didn't find it. Uh, practical to maintain it, because we wanted to do so much floor plan changes that we would have to essentially rebuild all the walls and we wanted to at least have nine foot ceilings because my husband's six five <laughs> and so for we always say it's like me having seven foot ceilings if it's eight foot ceilings um, so we would like to raise the ceilings which would re-roof the entire house so we figured well we might as well just rebuild it than trying to redo the entire house um, and so here we are. <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Anyone have any questions of the applicant? No? Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're now going to invite uh, speakers from the public. I have one card for Lee Cantata, please. Lee Cantana, 5 Palm Avenue. Happy to talk to you again. Um, I want to start off by saying I have no problem with the project itself, the ANS application. My issues are with the process, and um, I think Commissioner Hansen uh, alluded to part of the problems that I have with the process. Uh, <clears throat> this particular piece of property has a general plan designation of uh, low density residential. It has a zoning designation of a highway commercial. The use that has existed on the site for almost 70 years and that will continue to exist on the site has always been residential. Um, so that the use and our general plan map designation are consistent and the goals and policies of the general plan are consistent with the residential land use. However, <laughs> the zoning is not consistent with the land use and, and both by town regulations and state law, um, 
the zoning has to be consistent with the general plan. So the way I look at it is you have to change the zoning or you have to change the general plan. Um, the general plan land use is what the town has determined as the long-term goal of this particular piece of land, and it's been in that, that use for quite a long time. If you change the zoning to R1, you no longer have an issue with having to have a CUP. You no longer have an issue of having to request a variance. It is a much cleaner process, and it's also consistent with state law. Um, in addition, in the past, this type of, to use a CUP, I'll give an example. Right across the street on Magnuson Loop and Las Gatos Boulevard, there is a mixed-use office building that has office below, residential above. And the zoning and the general plan are consistent with the office use. A CUP, I assume, was used to approve the residential use, which, was, which is not a permitted use under the office zoning, but it is with a CUP. The CUP was used not to replace the existing use, but to add a use different than those that are uh, permitted by right. I hope that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any questions? Commissioner Kane? Hang on, Ms. Quintana. I want to ask staff a question. So earlier the question was asked, why didn't we rezone it? And the response was the expense was seemingly, the extra expense was seemingly uh, unnecessary. Now, what I'm hearing now is that it you know, can be viewed as being necessary, and if in fact that was the case, then I want to know what the additional expense would be. Do you have any estimate on that process? We can get the additional expense uh, shortly. Uh, while you're deliberating, but it also requires going through uh, the town council, so it's that added expense as well. Um, there are currently <coughs> two avenues in the town code to allow what the applicant is requesting. The one is the current process they're going through. The other would be, as Ms. Quintana said, to go through the CUP or to go through the rezoning process. Currently, the town code allows a conditional use permit for residential uses in many of our uh, commercial zones. We are, that is one of the items that the plan development committee is going to be addressing to try to um, take care of that and at least discuss that issue and see if there are um, opportunities to modify either code and or general plan language to make those situations um, different to probably get closer to the mixed use uh, scenario Ms. Quintana raised across the street on Magnuson Loop. Um, I will, and maybe Ms. Mosley is grabbing the sheet now, so she will get that monetary difference, but it's also the added additional town council requirement. I don't think the case before us is that complicated, um, but Ms. Quintana is, is, it sounds like she's saying that plan A is inappropriate. Uh, and that Plan B is not only um, makes more sense, but is the only appropriate avenue. In this case, could we, in fact, if we chose to, go with Plan A and avoid the additional expense? The current Plan A being in the current proposal? Yes. Then I don't have a question. That's too bad, because I have an answer. <laughs> All right, any further questions? No, thank you. Typically at this point, we give the applicant an additional three minutes to speak. If there were any questions or issues brought up, would you like an additional three minutes? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of the option to rezone, but uh, obviously added expense, not not desirable. Um, added time to go to town council, also not that desirable for us. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? No? All right, we're now going to... What? I just guess we... I, I, w I would just hope that in the future we do it differently. 
Commissioner Hansen brings up the point. Why didn't we just rezone it, get it done once, instead of incurring the additional expense? That's my other comment. M Ms. Privetti? I just wanted to reiterate what Mr. Paulson said. Um, the speaker, Ms. Quintana, raised an important point, and the council agreed when they set up the Plan Development Study Committee to add the whole notion of conditional use permits and the way the town has historically used them appropriately per our existing town code, but it is entirely possible that through that study committee, there may be recommendations for town code amendments that would provide clarity on this. So there is a larger opportunity for a community discussion on this point through the study committee process, but tonight before you, you have an applicant who's um, abiding by one of two paths that are available legally under our town code. And so that choice has already been, that path has already been chosen. And so um, that's the item that is before you. All right, um, I'm gonna close the public portion of the hearing now and ask if any commissioners have any comments, questions of staff or a motion. Uh, Commissioner Kane was very fast. I have a comment uh, okay. to staff. I walk the property and on the north side of the property is the fast food restaurant. Um, it would be a shame if the applicant built a lovely new home and that fence fell down on them because it's in very sad condition. Uh, it's an eyesore. Um, and so I'll stick with the, with the potential liability of it falling down, um, if nothing else, to get that thing repaired and make it less of an eyesore. It runs, it runs the, the length of uh, um, the um, commercial property from east to west and then hooks north and the whole thing looks like it's ready to come down the lattice the wooden lattice above it has come down in portions and the whole thing is is leaning and bent so i'm i don't think i can make that part of this this condition but the applicant should tell them to make it part of it get that fence fixed thank you mr kane commissioner badami i'm ready to make a motion uh, I move to approve architectural and site application S-14-076, conditional use permit application U-14-023, and variance application V-14-002, requesting approval to demolish an existing single-family residence and construct a new single-family residence with reduced setbacks on property zone CH. I can make the refi required findings for CEQA. I can also make the required findings for demolition due to the current condition due to the substantial termite damage. I can make the required findings for a conditional use permit. We're retaining an existing housing unit. I can also make the required findings for approval of a variance application. We're retaining the existing setbacks that have been there for years. And I find that it's in compliance with the residential design guidelines. Thank you. Do we have a second? Commissioner Hansen? Okay. All right, any other comments or questions? All right, all in favor? Aye. Passes unanimously. Mr. Paulson, are there any appeal rights? There are appeal rights. Anyone who's not satisfied with the decision of the Planning Commission can appeal that decision. The forms are available in the clerk's office. There is a fee for filing the appeal, and the appeal must be filed within 10 days. All right, thank you. All right, we will now consider agenda item five. Conditional use permit number U-14-025, requesting approval to modify an existing CUP for Holtz Restaurant to construct and operate an outdoor dining patio with full liquor service on property zoned C-2, APN number 52904 83 Can I have a show of the hands of the commissioners that have visited the property? Are there any disclaimers from any of the commissioners? Commissioner Kane? I've discussed this matter with town council, that town attorney, um, and others. I consider Mr. Holt to be a good friend. Uh, we spent a lot of time together. We served on the board of directors for the Chamber of Commerce, of which he is now president, um, and wondered if I should reveal the relationship or recuse myself. And the response I've received consistently from all sources was that I should reveal um, the relationship and do my job, which I intend to do. In fact, I intend to give him a hard time on a couple of points. Thank you, Commissioner Kane. Ms. Mosley, I understand you're going to give us the staff report again. I am. Thank you. 
The subject site is located at the southwest corner of University Avenue and Las Gatas Saratoga Road. The existing tenant, Holtz, has occupied the space since 2013. Prior occupants have been Hobies and Baker Square. The applicant is requesting to modify their CUP to permit dining with full, to permit an outdoor dining patio with full liquor service that will be proposed along Las Gatas Saratoga Road frontage and to increase the permitted seating from 114 to 158 seats. In 2014, the applicant applied for a modification of their CUP in order to modify the permitted alcohol service from beer and wine to full liquor. At the same time, the applicant proposed a reduction in operating hours and a modification to the dining classification from high turnover sit down to a quality restaurant. The town council approved the applicant's requests in April of 2014. The applicant is proposing to install a new four foot masonry wall at the edge of the proposed patio to provide the required delineation as well as provide screening and protection from the busy street. The wall will reduce in height to three feet as it nears the corner to provide a clear line of sight for vehicles. And the wall will be set back a minimum of seven feet from the sidewalk along Las Gatas Saratoga Road. The wall will be faced with the same stacked stone used on the restaurant and new drought tolerant landscaping will be used between the wall and the sidewalk. The applicant has requested to utilize the same hours as the existing restaurant for the patio, which are 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. Sunday through Thursday and 9 a.m. to midnight on Friday and Saturday. While it is at the discretion of the commission to include this in their recommendation to the town council, the commission and the town council have historically restricted the use of outdoor patios, particularly when adjacent to res residential uses, to no later than 10 p.m. daily. As a result, staff suggests the inclusion of additional condition restricting the hours of out the outdoor patio to 10 p.m. daily. The use of a restaurant in the downtown requires one parking space for every four seats. The property has 46 spaces in the parking district and 13 parking spaces on site for a total of 59 spaces. The proposed use requires only 40 parking spaces. In conclusion, staff recommends that the commission forward a recommendation of approval to the town council and that the proposed use complies with parking, does not have an impact to the traffic above <clears throat> that of the previous tenant and complies with the town's alcoholic beverage policy. In addition, the applicant is proposing to locate the patio furthest away from the residential use to the rear and would improve the appearance of the property frontage along Las Gatas Saratoga Road, which would include a new landscaping buffer between the proposed patio and the street. This concludes staff's report. We are here if you have any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions, Commissioner Erickson? So when the, thank you for your report, Ms. Mosley. Um, when the police department reviewed the application and they had no concerns or no comments, did they, what hours of operation were the, so did they have concerns about them operating, having operating hours on the patio beyond 10 p.m.? They did not specifically mention any. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hansen. I, I was just curious, um, I, I, I think I, you know, my sense says that, that this is not the case, but wouldn't they be the first restaurant to have outdoor patio on Highway 9, or am I, am I missing something? I mean, I know, like, there's other restaurants in downtown, like Willow Street, for example. You know, we go there all the time. They have that, but they're on a much less traffic area. I was just curious. I mean, this is a, this is a first for Highway 9, isn't it? This would be the first, because the only other restaurant on uh, Highway 9 is Double D's. And they don't have an outdoor patio out there. Any other questions? No? Thank you, Ms. Mosley. Of course. Okay, we'll now invite, well, I'm sorry, we'll now open the public portion of the hearing and give the applicant five minutes to speak. Uh, Alex Holt, you have five, moment, five minutes to speak. Uh, please make sure you pull the microphone up to you. And when the yellow light comes on, you have 30 seconds left. I'm taller. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Alexander Holt. Uh, I'm the owner of Holt's Restaurant uh, together with my wife, Sarah Holt. Uh, I also live here since um, 2012. And uh, I'm planning on living here, uh, raising my kids here, uh, becoming a big part of the Los Gatos community. Uh, like uh, Mike uh, mentioned, I was on the board of Chamber of Commerce. I apologize. <laughs> 
So um, uh, it is uh, very important to me uh, uh, that I grow my community role and uh, act as a good role model. And I'm very open to questions uh, as we're going over this. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to speak in front of you. Um, why am I here today? I'm trying to uh, satisfy uh, my guests at the restaurant. Uh, we were here in April last year uh, trying to add a liquor license. That was approved anonymously, and we were very grateful for that uh, because that was something that my guests really wanted. And uh, well, after receiving it, we really have seen um, a busier bar scene uh, and something that really is kind of fulfilling uh, the dining experience that we have tried really hard to create where uh, people come in, they have a nice drink after work, they have a nice meal, they sit, they relax, they have a two hour long um, dinner and then uh, they leave and they go home and they go to sleep. So a um, couple of things that I want to mention that I think is very important uh, in this um, uh, submittal and this uh, um, trying to get this done is uh, I don't understand the reasoning behind uh, closing the patio at 10 p.m. Um, when we are allowed to be open inside the restaurant till midnight on Fridays and Saturdays. Um, I could potentially see uh, um, a pretty big benefit for Los Gatos having an option for young adults and uh, or clientele in general that is usually between 30 and 70. Uh, they want to come in for a nice experience, and in my opinion, there is a lack of a place to go for a couple that are dating or a married couple that have a babysitter. They have their date night for the their long work week. Friday night comes along, they go to Holtz for dinner, and there's absolutely nowhere for them to go after 9, 9.30 when they're done with dinner. So what I'm proposing is that they can now come outside, sit in a really nice looking patio. We're not proposing to do the typical iron chairs, very uncomfortable, um, where you kind of sit down, eat, and leave. What we're proposing to do like a little bit more upscale couch feel, like, like loungier, uh, very nice looking and very uh, contemporary um, that I think would really benefit uh, our diners and uh, it would be a good way for them to round off their evening sitting out there having an extra uh, little bite, maybe having their dessert out there. And um, I think uh, overall it would be very important to not reduce the hours because it wouldn't make sense to if people sit down at 8 o'clock and they, why would we rush them to leave after 10? It doesn't make sense because we are not that type of a place uh, where that would be a problem in my opinion. I think it would be very nice to be able to um, keep serving them until the same hours that we have on the in indoor. Um, and then there might be a discussion later when we talk about that wall that we're going to build uh, to, obviously everyone knows Highway 9, certain hours of the day is a pretty busy street, and how is it going to look and feel to sit out there and, and have dinner. Um, one of the reasons why I don't want the regular 30-inch um, tables, like dining tables, is because you need to come down a little bit lower so you get that. Uh, that wall is supposed to, uh, 42 inches is normally your uh, regular private uh, dining where noise doesn't really come in as much. Uh, and uh, thank you. And uh, pretty much what I'm trying to say is that it's very important to me uh, if it's an option for, I don't know how this process really works, but in the plan, uh, Marnie recommended to say four foot, so it goes from three foot and then up to four foot. I prefer if it could go from three foot to five foot, uh, but I don't know if that's something that can change today or not. I just wanted to put that out there. I think a five foot wall would be a lot better for the sound uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you, any questions? Commissioner Badami? So you described your furniture as being more upscale, more lounge-like. So does that mean it would stay on the patio overnight? Would you secure it? Uh, it would stay overnight, yes. OK. 
Okay, here's my concern. Uh, there's somewhat of a homeless contingent that, that lives you know, right where the overpass underpass is there with 17. So I can easily see people scaling the wall and you know, taking a nap there during the night. Uh, and you might have some um, hygiene problems as a result. So it's just something to think about. Uh, and I'm not sure if the other commissioners might want to um, see the furniture brought in as we've done with other restaurants um, during the night. Commissioner Talifor. Thank you. Um, just to elaborate on that point, when you were describing the kind of furniture you see, I see here on exhibit uh, G3.0, um, I see tables and chairs. And then I just heard you say something about the furniture being couch-like? Yeah, more like that comfortable where you have a cushion and it's not that iron rod uh, where it's very uncomfortable to sit at. Okay, I, I understand. Um, so anyway, and then getting to uh, Commissioner Badami's point, which is always my bailiwick too with outdoor restaurants, is um, the whole idea of the outdoor furniture. And in your uh, proposed conditions of approval, number nine, which is in exhibit three, I don't know if you've read these, but it does say that the outdoor furniture, including tables, chairs, and heat lamps, shall be placed indoors at or before the close of business. Are you aware of that? Uh, no, I did not read that. Okay, which is what we are uh, requiring of other restaurants as well. So that's what I wanted to ask you about. And I, and I have one more question. Okay, my other question is the hostess stand, is that a permanent, what, what, can you describe that for me? What, what does that look like? Um, I don't. It's. I haven't seen it in the elevations, and I see it pictured here on G.30 as a rectangle, but I have no idea what it is. Uh, no disrespect to this uh, beautiful table, but it's uh, very similar to this, just a little bit more elegant. And uh, so th that's a movable table as well. You yes. would not be leaving it out there. No. Okay, and um, that's all for now, Commissioner Hansen. I just wanted to make sure I understood your intent with the patio. It, it sounded to me like um, the way you envision things to work, and, and if I said it wrong, please correct me. You People would come in, they'd have their meal in the restaurant, but then they would go outside to the patio like it was a bar area? No. I mean, at the, okay, good, because so that's right. what I thought I heard you say. Because, yeah. uh, okay, if you could explain. No, that is uh, the, the inside use and the outside use will be exactly the same. Uh, what I was trying to uh, explain was that at the, at the later, I know myself, uh, what I was trying to explain is that at the end of the night, you know, if you have a good time and you're done with dinner, it would be nice to go sit somewhere uh, with a little bit better ambiance. And me personally, I love sitting outdoor where you can kind of sit and talk and catch up with your friends and finish your dinner maybe at a later hour than 10. Are you talking about if they had dinner at your restaurant or at another restaurant and came to your place? Uh, in my restaurant, mostly. Okay, so so they're you're, they're meeting the requirement to have the meal by eating in your restaurant, but then they're going to come out and have drinks without having food on the patio. Uh, no, what I was kind of envisioning was uh, you come in and you have dinner, and if the patio is already full by by the time that they are done with their dinner and other people have moved, uh, potentially being able to have like your dessert by the, like, the nice outdoor ambiance is kind of what I was thinking. Can I ask a quick question? Um, as far as the hours on the patio, did you reach out to, uh, there's, I know there's not a lot of residential there, but did you do a little outreach and just let them know what you were proposing and get some feedback? Uh, I'm really good friends with the only neighbor and that is, uh, on the complete opposite of where the patio would be and on the entire intersection. I, I, know, I know where it is. Okay. I just want to know if you... Uh, I did not talk to them specifically about this, uh, but I, I can personally say that they wouldn't have a problem with it because they are usually out there having fun when we're done closing the restaurant. Okay. All right. Commissioner Kane, you had a question? With the chair's permission, I have a couple of questions. Um, and... I'm supposed to ask you questions, so I'm going to put this in the form of questions. Do you understand that, um, no, when you talk about the hours that the patio should close at 10 and that 
that's not uh, entirely okay with you. I think the response you're going to get is that the commission and town council have, historic, have historically restricted the use of outdoor patios, presumably all over town, um, that they close them down at 10 o'clock. And they add, especially when it's adjacent to residential, to a residential property. I think that's the answer you're going to get is because they haven't let anybody else do it. Is that correct? I would look to Ms. Mosley. I'm not aware of any that have outdoor dining past 10 p.m., um, but Ms. Mosley probably has done further research on that. I apologize. I have not done specific research on that. Um, in the last probably five or six years, I'm not aware of any that the council has considered outdoor seating and not done that restriction on. So it's been a recent historical, any that may have allowances beyond that would predate um, the, the, the recent history. So using that trend by the council, we, we suggested that restriction. Thank you. So that's what you may be up against. I wanted to ask some, some other questions. Um, I've been in town 34, 35 years and feel like there's been um, some erosion to the existing alcohol policy that the town has, which policy is fortunately undergoing review. Um, but to what the commissioner is asking you, I need to know um, that you in fact understand the proposed patio, just like the entire restaurant, would be required to provide full meal service with all alcohol sales. That is to say, you cannot get a drink without a meal. Do you understand that? Yes. Um, another item that concerns me with respect to erosion of the town code is what you're promising the chief of police. Um, in Exhibit 4 of stamp submissions, it says, all establishments shall use an employee training manual that addresses alcoholic beverages consistent with the standards of the state of California. So my issues are kids in bars, kids sitting at the bar and, and uh, drinks being given with a wink and um, the fact that staff is not educated on these on these conditions. Um, so do you have a plan to educate your staff with respect to these conditions? Uh, we already have that in place. Uh, we make them take about a seven page test. I don't have that with me. Obviously I wasn't prepared, uh, but if you'd like, I can submit such uh, tests. So you can, it's called a Holtz alcohol test and it goes over like, uh, when should they be ID'd? When should they not, you know, uh, pretty much everything that has to do with alcohol. And uh, um, it's, I would say, probably one of the hardest ones. I had to do some studying to find all the answers myself. And uh, uh, I, I think it's very important to, I take it very seriously uh, when we did get the ABC license to do the things the right way. And uh, uh, my wife is a preschool principal and she's very, She's trying to get me in shape, uh, do things the right way, and that way you don't have to redo it. And before I was a little bit more, oh, let's just get it done. And then um, after being married for two years, uh, I've learned to do things the right way. It's uh, usually the best way to do it. I'm not familiar with the, with the entire ABC code, but I know that they, uh, I'm led to believe that they restrict children sitting at the bar. So that's point number one. Point number two is alcohol will only be served with a meal. And those are my two points that I'm asking uh, do you have a plan? Shall you educate staff on these two points? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you. Commissioner Hansen. Oh, um, kind of following up and, and making a little bit of a different question from what Commissioner Kane just asked. So a hypothetical scenario. So you've got, um, you've got people that are, you know, near age, you know, right around 21. So, so how does this process work? They, they come in the restaurant, they order their dinner inside uh, who checks their ID and then they decide to go outside who checks their ID and who checks to make sure that they actually ate inside. If there's a hostess sitting outside, how, how would they know if they actually ate? It will be uh, two different, uh, separate people that they would order from. So uh, there will be a designated server outdoor 
uh, and you obviously cannot bring the alcohol out on the street and then into the patio. So what, whoever they order from in the bar or inside the, in the restaurant would be in charge of checking their IDs and we check IDs if they look younger than 30. And we're very tight on that because I don't want it to become a problem. Uh, so I tell my staff all the time, did you check their ID? Did you check their ID? And uh, sometimes um, people kind of like see it as a compliment. So it, it usually works out pretty good to do check IDs uh, pretty uh, tight. My wife, in fact, was uh, asked for um, for her ID yesterday, and she was shining up like uh, like a sun. Um, so my point is that uh, the there would be you would get your uh, ID checked inside, and then if you were to order something outside, that server would be in charge of their food order or drink order on the on the patio. Okay, so uh, uh, that answers part of my question. The the other part of my question was going back to the use of the patio and not it being a bar. Um, it, what's the process for checking to make sure that they actually ordered a meal like they? And they, and they they did that before they came outside. Uh, it actually would probably start over the process. So just because that they you know came from the inside or didn't come from the inside, it's still the same thing when they go on the outside. Like that new server still have the same rules to follow. And uh, I believe what the what the rules are saying is that we have to as a restaurant provide. Um, a full menu. It cannot just be snacks and what we're planning on doing is uh, serving or a bar menu or dinner menu and our dessert menu on the patio as well. Okay, so um, my husband and I come to your restaurant after this gets approved and uh, we walk out to the hostess outside and say, you know, we'd like to be seated and is she going to ask me if, I, if I'm ordering a meal? And what if I said I was already inside? I mean, I, I, I'm just not seeing how the process is going to work to keep this from people sitting there drinking and doing nothing else. Um, that's a good question. So the hostess would probably not ask, you know, are you intending of having a meal? Uh, the hostess would say how many people and then where, you know, inside or outside. And then they would get it seated and then the server would come up and ask, what would you like to eat? What would you like to drink? Okay, well, I, I see that as a hole in the process that, you know, that I think you need to address. So. Commissioner Kane, then Commissioner Telsfor. So I'm guessing this isn't the first time this bridge has been crossed. Um, I would hope that what we apply to Holtz Restaurant is the same thing we apply to the other patio restaurants. And, and I would hope that you don't view the patio as a bar because that's what's being said. They, they can't. It's going to be a sticky wicket if they have dinner inside and then go outside for more drinks and they're joined by friends and it, it it's a sticky wicket. I I wouldn't let them go outside, you know, just hold them inside because I don't know how to control the outside and you've got to be very careful with that. But on the other hand, we want him to be held to the same standards that we hold other places that already deal with this situation. So I think I'm going to ask staff really quick to clarify um, for other restaurants around town that have indoor seating and a patio, what kind of conditions have we put into the verbiage to <coughs> ensure that it's not treated as a bar? Um, we don't have those other conditions with us, but just operationally what typically has happened is that there's one hostess for the entire restaurant, and then the diners are given the choice, would you like to dine inside or outside? They are seated for their restaurant meal, and then they enjoy, you know, whichever choice they, they choose. Um, you know, in looking at the draft permit in Exhibit 3, if the commission would like, they could um, modify condition number five to include, um, you know, that a dessert menu is not, would not be considered a complete meal. So if there's concern that this would become more of an after dinner drinks as opposed to a full meal, um, you know, condition five could be modified accordingly. So that's another option. Um, and then there's um, the proposal that staff gave to you regarding the patio hours, which is not in the draft condition, 
but if that's of interest would be uh, part of could be part of a motion to the council because council makes the final decision thank you commissioner tell us for um, well, just to my input is that often I will go to a restaurant that has outdoor seating and it, the, the hostess has said to, to us, um, it, this is for a meal. I mean, it's just, if you want to sit out here, you will, be, you have to order a meal. It's just said with the, you know, with that mm -hmm. in mind. So it could be one way to close the loop in that Absolutely. hole that we're looking at. Um, but I do have a question for you. So... It's a very busy intersection. Lots of cars, lots of brakes, lots of exhaust, lots of noise, and you want to put an outdoor patio. So I question that. And I, I, can you explain to me um, how you see it differently, or if you do? Uh, I think that when you're sitting with friends, having dinner in a nice setting, and you have a uh, preferably a five foot wall, uh, blocking all that off, all you're gonna really see, because we tried this with a piece of plywood and we s sat there with tables and chairs and all you really see on that's like looking outside, instead of getting uh, a busy street, now you're getting like the top, the trees, the mountains, you get like that really nice uh, look. And uh, also for the people Pretty much 80% of the people that have dinner inside, they sit along that one side um, on Highway 9. And they constantly complain that they get the headlights in their eyes and um, that it's not that appealing to look at a busy street. Some other people say that it looks like they're in New York. And I don't know what they're thinking, but that's a different story. So uh, I think that the building the patio and the wall is going to like kill two in one, uh, it's a Swedish saying, two birds in one stone or whatever I believe is the American saying. Um, it's gonna make it a lot more appealing from the inside looking out because now you're gonna look at people moving around and it's gonna be nice ambiance. And then on the people that are sitting out there, they're gonna be looking into a nice looking restaurant. And the people looking in from the street, they are now no longer gonna see uh, an old coffee shop, bakery or, um, diner, they're going to see an upscale restaurant, and that's what we are. And I think it's very important that we get that overall feel um, to kind of tie it all in. Follow up. So I'm a little concerned now. You're asking for a five-foot wall. And I, I'm having a little hard time trying to visualize that five-foot wall is going to come how high on your windows, because your windows are one of the main features of that building. It's 19, probably built in 1960, I would think. And that's, you know, it's, it's significant as far as that design, whether you like it or not, it, clear, it tells you an error that it was built. So I'm having a hard time seeing this five foot wall and how that's going to work. And I don't have, you don't have a vision, you know, elevation of it here because you have a four foot wall. So I'm 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 stymied with how I'm going to. So the, re the reason wall, the reason why the four foot so the three foot wall is you know about knee high, uh, that's for the, the for the traffic. That's very loud. Uh, so for the traffic uh, problem. You do actually have to take the microphone over with you. It comes out. Um, so that I, I understand. I understand. I'll yeah. stay right here. Right. I, I mean. So, so pretty much what I wanted to say was that, you know, the, the three foot I completely understand because it's a busy street, you got to see the traffic, 100% oh, yes. understand that. Uh, so the rest of the wall is pretty much halfway or so, maybe a little bit less than half is three foot. And then when it goes to four, it, it, that's just this much more. And it, then you might as well just do it three and then it doesn't block the sound, which is the reason why I think it's so important to build it. Uh, but at five foot, it comes above that 42 inches, which is seated privacy, and the noise will come over your head versus coming right in your ear. Because if you, if you I, sit, I like understand. the wall will, on a four foot, it will literally go by your ear, right. and you're gonna be. Yeah. I, I understand that. I'm thinking aesthetics of a long, solid wall like that in front of your building, and I'm having. I wish I could see, have a vision of that. Um, and I see where does the three foot. Is wall start? Is that where your last table is here against the wall? 
I don't have the it's blueprints in front of me. So I, how many feet? I, I mean, I'm going to assume that staff checked as far as with the police as far as visibility or, along with that? Yes, that is why it's reduced at that point. They did do the, uh, based on the corner site triangle, um, they reduced it to three feet in that area. If you look at the last sheet of the of exhibit seven. Right, I see that. You'll see the elevations and you'll see where that three foot starts as well as I think while you're looking at it, I'm going to let Commissioner Badami go ahead and speak. Do you plan on having speakers with amplified music for the outdoor uh, patio area to kind of muffle the uh, traffic from Highway 9? Uh, no, but we're planning on having maybe some kind of a uh, water feature that will kind of uh, create, it's called white noise apparently. I've been doing a little bit of research on this and it helps creating ambiance and it helps uh, making it like soften the surrounding uh, noise. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. In addition, um, I had a quick question because we don't have any kind of landscape drawings. I would assume, you know, this question about the wall and the height, that it isn't just going to stay a wall. You're going to plant landscaping in front of this and soften the wall. Yeah, um, so. Something on uh, the wall. I don't know. But obviously, I'm up to, to modify my plans based on what uh, town council and you guys uh, would like to see. Uh, in terms of those little details. Uh, but my vision is to have uplighting, because the wall is, I don't, are you, can you guys kind of picture the stone material? The stones are really beautiful. And uh, with a little bit of uplighting on it, it really looks uh, very presentable in my opinion. And um, the natural, the, to re, you know, we're in a draw, so we're trying to be uh, conscious about, you know, not using water, so there is a lot of, uh, really nice uh, draw tolerant plants. Uh, if you uh, have you driven by the new project on Blossom Hill and uh, Los Gatos Boulevard, yeah. they have that. It's almost the same look of a wall in front of Phil's Coffee, and they also have draw tolerant plants right in front of it. It looks really nice, uh, I think. And um, I think that answered the question. I hope. All right. Do we have any other I, questions, Commissioner Talisor? Yeah, I, I, yes, I understand. I'm thinking that you do say drought turned. Are you thinking of covering this wall with a vine of some type to soften, soften it in areas, or no? I haven't thought too much about a uh, a vine. If that's what you guys want, it's not that big of a deal. I'm thinking more of like those nice, like different looking California drought tolerant plants to kind of soften it and make it look really artistic and nice. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Well, normally we have people come and speak and then you have three more minutes. So if you, aside from the questions, I guess if you have three minutes of anything else you'd like to address, you can. Let me check my notes and I will. <laughs> No, I think we did a good job covering it all. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna close the public portion of the hearing. Does anyone have any comments, question, or want to venture a motion, Commissioner Erickson? So this is a question to staff. Um, is there any problem with the five foot wall rather than the four foot wall with respect, from a staff perspective? Staff directed the applicant to reduce the wall height from the originally proposed five foot um, uh, down to four feet based on the just recently rescinded outdoor seating policy that was rescinded by the town council last night. Um, so you would have the ability to uh, increase that to five feet if you were comfortable with that um, additional height. Uh, staff did feel that the th four feet actually helped integrate the patio with the uh, sidewalk, which is the intention of outdoor seating uh, primarily in the downtown. But code-wise? You it, would have the ability to. There is nothing that restricts you from, from providing that recommendation to the town council. Okay. 
Commissioner Talis for, then Commissioner Hansen. Yeah, the thing that bothers, uh, wait, are we having a discussion? We're allowed to have, we're discussing now? Yeah. The thing that bothers me about the, um, the wall at five feet is that that's what, that's what it is, it's a wall. So coming into town, you're going to see a wall. And I don't know why it's not integrated uh, into the design, it's an add-on feature. So I'm just having a little trouble with that visually. That's why I think vegetation would be extremely important to soften the appearance of it. I don't care what kind of stone it is, but it's, it's that, it's hardscape and it's hard. And it's an entry point into town. All right, Commissioner Hansen, Erickson, Kane. Um, getting back to this question about the um, the use, the actual use, and in, in, in making sure that it's in what we intended in our approval, do we have any um, any restaurant with? I don't know if you know the answer or not. That has outdoor seating where they have more than one hostess. Because it seemed to me like I've, I'm thinking of having gone to Willow Street many times. You you go in the restaurant um, inside. There's only one hostess. They ask you, do you want to sit inside or outside? And and pretty much every restaurant I can think of is the same. And and um, it, that, to me, that that having a separate outside hostess is very problematic. And I I don't know if that's a limitation we could put on this or to, to, that they have to enter in one place and you know, to, so that there's a process to make sure that they're there to have a meal with drinks, not just drinks. Yeah, if the commission is interested in um, adding that to their recommendation, then they could uh, do away with the hostess stand outside and just have all of the hostess serving or servicing from the interior, as I'm assuming it currently is. Do we have an, uh, an example of a restaurant that's that's set up with outdoor seating that's done that successfully that also serves alcohol that has two hostesses. No, I didn't not that I'm aware. Can I add one little note? Um, so the hostess stand was actually a suggestion from staff based on, again, the outdoor seating policy that states that uh, that patrons that are seating on the patio should be seated by a restaurant um, hostess. Uh, there was a concern that by not having by having the hostess from the restaurant inside, and not having it overseen, uh, the outdoor patio overseen uh, consistently by a hostess, that there was gonna, that was going to be problematic um, if it was going to be open in the way that they wanted to do it. And so that was something that they included on the suggestion of staff. So if you have further recommendations and ways to accomplish that. Um, that is your purview. I, I had assumed it was for security reasons. I think it's probably a bit of a benefit for that reason. But um, actually, it's no. It's Commissioner Erickson, then Kane, and then Commissioner Erickson. Did you still have a question? So, the if I'm if assuming the drawings are correct, I'm back to the wall. Um, so the exit from that area that's at the very north end of that wall is according to the drawing six feet high and to Commissioner Talisford's concern about it blocking the if you look at the drawing there's quite a bit of window showing above that but if, if I'm reading them right so it would be essentially if you want to visualize it halfway in between where the top of the wall is now and that that exit area but the six I assume and the drawings don't show us this but I assume the the wall that's wrapping around on the north side, I believe that's north, anyway, to the, if you would, to the town parking lot, is six feet from that point wrapping around. Is that right? But I can't. I do not believe it's delineated on the plans at this time. If you have directions, you guys, you can provide direction as to the height of that. It's not delineated, but it, it would be a safe assumption that it would be six feet. Yeah, I couldn't find it either, so thanks. Commissioner Kane, and then Commissioner Talis for. Uh, I share the concerns about the wall, not the height, but the appearance. And I thought, I thought there was a recommendation in here about providing uh, some sort of appropriate plant coverage outside the wall. So whereas I'm not ready to make a motion, um, I'd like to consider in advance that the motion should include subject to the approval of the community development director there would be appropriate plant coverage 
uh, whether that's bushes spaced three feet apart or four feet apart or two feet apart, it would break up the appearance of a wall if he has indirect lighting on the wall from the outside. So we don't put in a hedgerow, which would kill the lighting. We just put in plants appropriately uh, spaced that presumably uh, were at or would grow to uh, the height of six feet. And it would just break up the... Um, the appearance of a wall. It, it would give it a nice effect, especially with the indirect lighting. But beyond that, yet we don't design from the dais, but I'm just wondering if it's, if it's worth mentioning that if the, um, the wall runs east to west and on the west side is where the uh, hostess station is, I'm just wondering if we sealed that off it's going to cost you a buck or two, but if we sealed that off and had a door um, in the restaurant, in the middle of the restaurant, so that when people came through the main doors, they told the hostess where they wanted, where, where they'd like to be seated, and they were escorted to that seat by using the inside door rather than having to go back outside. If there's no inside door, then it seems to me that what's being suggested with two hostesses may be the only solution, but if we wanted one hostess, then you would have one access egress through the main door and then use the inside door to get to the patio. And what we're also saying is, you know, it, I hear what the applicant is envisioning, and I'm saying that's problematic. You make a decision to be outside or inside, and like all the other restaurants I know, that's pretty much where you stay. You don't then go outside for drinks with friends and create problems with other people joining you. I see his vision, but our experience is you sit inside or outside, and that's where you stay for the time being. So that's a whole bunch of stuff. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I, I want to know if I can address your discussion on the doors, so, um, constructability-wise and cost-wise, because um, I had thought about the same thing. But if you go out the front of there, those uh, columns in between the windows are structurally load-bearing and are quite old to renovate the front of that to add doors in that would meet code. Um, would be a substantial cost and problem. So I looked at the same thing, but when I went and looked at it, it's asking I, a lot. I know that's your expertise, and I came up with a plan B. Um, folks that are going to be sitting out there will likely get their food service through the back door. So there is a door that leads out on the, on the east side of the building, um, and, and if somebody wants to sit out there, then somebody escorts them through the restaurant and out that back door and onto the patio, which is sealed off. So you don't need two hostesses, is, is what I'm saying. You simply need it. Actually, we've, you can't. unless we're going to open the public <laughs> portion, you, I'm sorry. So anyway, there is a door. Um, if if I, I understand you want to stand these things better than I do, if you can't put a door in there, there is a proverbial back door that might be a solution. Commissioner Talisfor. Um So to comment on two hostesses or not, actually I believe that the other restaurant in town that has two hostesses, one for the outdoor patio and one for the restaurant, is... Um, the wine cellar. So you can eat outside, and if you don't want to, you can go downstairs, and a hostess will show you somewhere in the in there. So that works quite well, and I, I see a real need to have that done. So it, it, we do have precedence for it. But um, another, it's an architectural question about the wall. So I've noticed here on G3.0 that um, if you look at the, the side uh, lawn, or vegetation area that's next to the sidewalk it does as it as it, cur it has a curve in it I, I do you remember this I, I'm pointing it out to you I can't but there's a curve in this wall in this area here mm -hmm. what I was hoping is that the wall instead of coming to a straight angle could mimic the um, the curve in that uh, planted area it would soften the wall a lot I think it would add a little a nice detail as well so I, I would like I'm sure if, if you're ready to make a motion we could potentially add that okay <laughs> all right then <laughs> going to make a motion 
like how you do that. They just bring that right on you. Okay, I'm going to make a motion, and then um, if my other commissioners have uh, any uh, conditions they would like to add, I will please uh, add, you know, jump in. So I um, <clears throat> will make a motion to approve conditional use permit U-14-025 at 165 Las Gatos Saratoga Road. Um, the applicant is Alexander Halt. It, this is, by the way, a recommendation for approval to the town council. So my um, motion is not for approval, but as a recommendation to forward it to town council. I can make the um, general plan designate. I can make uh, the findings as, as um, exhibited in Exhibit 2, which are uh, required under CEQA and required findings for a conditional use permit as required by Section 2920190 of the Town Code for granting a conditional use permit, and that would be one through four, and required findings for the redevelopment plan for the Central Las Gatos Redevelopment Project area, and required findings for the town's alcohol beverage policy. Um, and that would be uh, A through C, and um, that's my motion. All right, we have a second. I'll second it. <laughs> Do we have any discussion or comments, Commissioner Padami? I just, I just have a question. So, does that mean your motion includes uh, the hours till 12 a.m.? Uh, no, the motion include. Oh. Yes, I forgot that recommendation by staff that the outdoor seating uh, would be open only until 10 p.m. daily. And then I think, um, who else had something they wanted to add? Commissioner. To the maker of the motion, I'd like to add language um, along the lines of, rather than us getting into plant design, so the, the community development director knows what our intent is, so subject to the approval of the community development director, um, appropriate plant coverage, um, bushes, interspaced as appropriate, be added to the outside of the wall, which wall is to be five feet? Oh, we have to talk, oh. That's my. I, I, I would feel, in my opinion, if, if there's proper vegetation, the difference between four feet and five feet is pretty minimalistic. And if it creates a better sense of ambience in there. So my requested, um, my requested addition would be five feet if that's acceptable to the maker of the motion. It is, um, especially, I would just like to note that the landscaping is actually to be chosen so that it actually breaks up the, um, the long run of that wall and softens it. And I forgot to add <laughs> that I wanted to um, also have the east of oh, west, the west end of that long wall replicated, uh, replicate the curve in the lawn planted area. I'm not sure how to describe that. Can I area. can I ask you a question about that just to make sure? Yes. So even if you have that wall mimic the curve, you are going to have that new exit door exactly where it is because the walkway ramp meets ADA compliance and the slope of that is set by code. So that door is going to be where that door shows, that exit. So you're going to have a, a, a curved wall dive into an odd looking corridor thing. There. It, it, I, it, honestly, let me ask you this. If that wall was just slightly curved, could that work or not? As long as you're fine with that door is going to be exactly where the door shows because that walk, exas, existing walkway ramp that is existing mm -hmm. is, I think, new. I, I think they just got updated yeah, recently with that. ADA. You can't mess with that. So that exit is going to be where that exit shows. So I think it, in light of aesthetics, instead of having it that odd, we should just keep the wall as it is. Clearly the architect okay, looked at that. Add add um, vegetation there, I guess. Okay, to soften that. All right, I go with that. Okay, thank you. Did you have another comment, Commissioner Kane? Okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye, passes unanimously. 
And there are no appeals because this is a recommendation to the council. Sometimes you get to the end of these meetings and you kind of feel like there should be, right? Like, yeah. All right. <laughs> exactly. Ms. Prevetti, do we have a report from the Director of Community Development? Uh, just briefly, last night uh, the town council considered a request for a refund for the Bayview uh, second unit, as you recall. Um, they, it was illegally removed. They came before you. You approved the legal removal of it. They appealed to the council for a refund, and the council granted it. Um, it was for, because of the unique circumstances of that particular case, and they were clear that it is not precedent setting. We still do have openings on boards and commissions, so if you know of any friends who would be interested, particularly in our Parks Commission, because we have no one yet who has volunteered we extended the uh, the uh, applications to the 15th of April and interviews will be held on the 21st of April. Thank you. <laughs> no, you cannot. Commissioner Hansen. Are we allowed to ask a question of the staff report? Oh, I, I, I know one of the um, committees that's being recruited for is the plan development committee. Is the plan development committee going to have representation from the planning commission? Yes, because it's the general plan committee plus the four, oh, okay. um, the two I've, residents, one business, and one developer. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you will. All right, do we have any other commissioner matter, matters? No? All right, we're adjourned.